When I used to clown a lot in the hospitals, I used to work for the Big Apple Circus um, in hospitals in Chicago and, and all kinds of like elder care facilities and places. And you learn, like sometimes I would be like, I'm gonna bail, I don't feel like they want us. Mm -hmm. You take the, It's called taking the temperature of the room. Oh, and now okay. I do it every day when I wake up, I'm like, what's the temperature of the world? Ah. Take the temperature of the world. Where I'm from, a group of friends had funny ways of sharing affection for each other through jokes and insults. These jokes and insults were otherwise known as caps. You probably know it now as getting roasted, only shorter and faster. The victim of a quick cap was someone that just got capped on. The wit that some kids had was uncanny, and if you weren't fast enough, someone who was great at capping would pour it on until you had nothing left to say. And if you were around a group of people to catch that, you just got clowned on. No matter how much I tried and who I hung around, I never had it. The quick wit to have a comeback just as sharp, if not more piercing than the ones that I'd get hit with. One day it came out of nowhere. I was on my way to class minding my business when this older kid Brian said that I looked like Gargamel, the villain from the Smurfs. It was in front of all the cool boys and girls at the time, and Brian being the class clown got some good chuckles out of that one. In real time, I had nothing to cap back at him. It bothered me the rest of the day. He really made me believe that I looked like Gargamel, which was funny, but also, I couldn't figure out something witty to say until much later in the day, and most likely, if I did say it at that time, it wouldn't be as funny as that. This one Sunday, totally unrelated to that story, long after that Gargamel comment, I tried to be funny in my own way. It was my community church, but it was more like a showcase for teenagers and some adults too to wear their best outfits and check each other out. Like it was on every Sunday, all the seats were full and the standing row was about three to four people deep across the back wall, all across the back wall, shoulder to shoulder. Even more people packed outside the door. A good buddy of mine and I were standing in the back of the church during that part where people lined up and received the bread chip. This teenage girl who was around our age at the time was singing her heart out in front of the entire congregation. She was beautiful. The whole scene was beautiful. The community, the music, her voice, everything. As the song was just seconds away from ending, I nudged my buddy and I told him, watch this. Really confident at the time, even for me, who's usually shy, head down, mouth open kind of thing. And as the song is ending, I start clapping with the intent to get the rest of the folks at church to clap along. A few seconds pass and nobody is joining in. I'm still the only one. But I didn't stop there. I doubled down and started going, woo! And at that point, people from all over the church looked back at us, side eyes, still, no clapping. At that moment, the priest stands up from his chair and he just says, let us pray. Then everybody goes back to focus on the mass and that's the last part. It's, sig it's the signal for time to go. I look at my buddy next to me. He knows I'm looking at him, but he's avoiding eye contact with me and his face is just red flush. Part of me really wanted to clap for that girl's performance because it was great. She deserved it. And part of me just wanted to start the applause just for kicks, like how people start a wave at a baseball game. In retrospect, now that moment was about two different types of performances. One good, one bad, and also the poor choice on my part, the inappropriate time and place for looking for that kind of reaction. In this episode, I search for why some people are just worlds better at performing than others, why some people can easily get laughs from people and others get buried in crickets. And for those that perform in front of an audience for a living, are they that much more confident than people who don't perform? What can we learn from those who think about how to make people laugh for a living? To help us answer these questions, we have Dan Griffiths, a lifetime performer and someone who has dedicated his life to the art of doubling down on folly. In clown school, when I was studying clown, clowns would be out sitting on the curb outside the school. I went to the Del Arte school and studied clown and we had a really tough teacher. And then years later I returned there and I got to be him. I got to teach the clown territory. And sometimes clowns just have the nose on their forehead <laughs> and they're just sitting on the street. They're like crying. Cause it, it's, um, it shows you, you so strongly. You got to let yourself 
have a lot of slack to be a human in the world. Mm. You were a hunter-gatherer ape mm -hmm. that suddenly got a lot smarter. All of a sudden, for like two million years, you had the same six tools, and then suddenly, you had suddenly. 32 tools, 64 tools, oh, language, all this stuff just yeah. suddenly happened to you, and we're constantly trying to catch up with that. Mm -hmm. We haven't really caught up with that at all. That way, man, I think somebody messed with us, John. Mm. I think someone came along and went, doink. They did something to us. Because mm. we were the same for like two or three million years. Yep. Nothing changed. Yeah. Greetings and welcome to the Quake City Portal. Dan Griffiths is a multi-talented experimental performance artist, award-winning theater director, teacher, and founder of the first Church of Clown in San Francisco. He founded the Clown Workshop, Clown Zero, Kaput Clown Theater, and some of his recent gigs include teaching at the Wu Chow International Circus Festival in, uh, uh, apologies for this pronunciation, Xi Zhuang, China. He also did work as a clown doctor and trainer for the Big Apple Circus and a director of Clown Zero, a medical clowning unit residence at the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. For almost 35 years since 1988, Dan has performed original theatrical works across the country and around the world. He studied at the Dell'Arte International School of Physical Theater and has served on the Faculty Clown Conservatory San Francisco, the, new sc the School for Mime Theater, Columbia College Chicago, Roosevelt University, Indiana University Northwest, and Academy of Art University. Dan holds an MA in Experimental Performance from the New College of California and an MFA in Interdisciplinary Art from the California Institute of Integral Studies. Yes, it takes a lot of hard work to become a clown. So, up ahead, in segment one, the mission of the Church of Clown. Segment two, the concept of jouet, the French word for play in a performance. Segment three, the use of humor and play as tools. Segment four, accepting foibles. Final segment, how to be easy on ourselves. In between segments, you'll hear snippets from Donut Goat, Dan's clown punk band, which we'll link to the show notes as well. There are live performances that you could find on YouTube of Dan, and um, all of that will be included at thequakecityportal.com. So please stick around and enjoy this great and enlightening conversation with Dan Griffiths, founder of the Church of Clown. It's super weird. I mean, I never thought that I would found a church. And that's just weird because I'm I'm not even that big of a fan of regular church, you know. Yeah. I went to church when I was a little kid. I went to there were three churches in my hometown strategically positioned so that there could be no liquor stores because there was some law about how far you could be from a church. Uh huh. So they spread them out over the tiny little town. Okay. Um, Ohio. I was in Kansas. Kansas. When I was a little kid. Yeah. Okay. In a little when I was real little. But um, yeah, Church of Clown came about because there isn't a Church of Clown in the world until now. <laughs> there are some churches that sometimes they come and they're dressed like clowns sometimes, but there just wasn't a thing kind of doing what we want to do. Okay. Yeah. So you're already pretty far along with yeah, the process okay. of it. Oh, um, I finished all of the paperwork. I'm an official 501c3 arts organization that okay. can receive donations in case anybody hears this and wants to send a donation to churchofclown.org yeah and there's a building a building is there a building no, no not building. a building yeah we'd love to have a building if anyone has a building and they want to give it yeah. to us it just <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, we are, we're always doing things in different spaces and some of the things because of the nature of the work it's site specific because we do service missions and we go to places where people need us to come. Okay. Yeah. And where would that be? Well, we do one here in the Bay Area. It's called Peanut Butter Jelly Time, and we just make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and then we pack the clowns' packs full of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, uh -huh. and we go out and give them to people that look like they could use a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah, yeah. And that's interesting and a fun way to um, make friends. Okay, so there's associations there's groups but then church is like a next level because yeah. there's well 
Yeah, because like, if there's a bunch of ways you can be a church. One way is if in the state of California, if you say you're a church, you're immediately a church as soon as you say you are. <laughs> and that's real, and you're a real church. But if you want to be a church... And the heaviest thing a church can do is not pay property taxes. That's the heaviest thing they can do. They uh, can buy a building and never pay property mm-hmm, tax. That's mm-hmm. heavy, right? In order to do that, you have to be a certain kind of church with the government that's even heavier than the level that we made it to. Mm-hmm. We're a 501c3 arts organization, just like any other arts organization, but we're officially a church because we say we are. Right. Okay. And that makes us legitimately a church, but we can't buy property and not pay property taxes. Uh, but we don't pay sales tax and things like that because we're a, like a regular arts organization. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So do you have like rituals or um, holidays <laughs> planned? <laughs> well, so far we have the Holy Fools Parade is our um, annual event. This year was the first annual Holy Fools Parade. Um, and we did it in Dolores Park and we got in trouble because we didn't have uh, a permit oh. to meet there. Mm. But there were a million people meeting there already. So they didn't really, they showed up because it was advertised in the newspaper uh-huh. somebody picked it up on a story or something and so no they shit. came and they were like what are you doing here you can't have a parade and I said what if we just sit here and they said you can't do that without a permit and I said what about all these people around me they don't have permits and they said ah don't get funny with us and yeah. then they left how many people showed up we had about 350 people down what? there it was a lot and they were dressed up people were some people had come because they found out about us from the other events that are like the Holy Fools Parade. The St. Stupid's Day Parade isn't happening right now, so it was on uh, only on Zoom. Mm-hmm. And so people that normally like to come out for that came out for us. Wow. Um, and that was nice of them to, to even mention that to their folks. Yeah. Um, and people just like to come out and support folly, you know? Our whole thing is praise folly. The one thing you can it's count folly. on in the universe is yeah. folly. That's what's going to happen. What's the defini- your definition of folly? Folly is just like the, the chaos that happens all the time. You got to be down with the chaos or you can't, you can't improvise around it. You know, if you're freaking out, you can't be tripping. You know, if you're tripping, the chaos will eat you. Wow. So you got to be down with like the changes and the weird things. You got to dance with it a little bit, the chaos. And I love that. be your buddy, you know? I love that. And we have like, you know, we have like our basic tenets of our of our church. Do you want to know? What yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, this is our this is official. This is our official mission statement. Okay, you ready? <laughs> okay, Church of Clown. Is a community supported public organization whose purpose is to embolden humanity through community, to teach resiliency through humor, to find humility through service, and to nurture inspiration through joy. Wow. That's our goal. Right, hey. it's heavy. You could talk about that all. Who day. doesn't want that? Right, those are all great things. <laughs> Everybody wants that. <laughs> um, that's why they let us be a five hundred one c three. Okay, right? which you is, had, means yeah. you're supposed to be doing something noble mm-hmm. for humanity. Did they want to see those, like your plan or your oh, mission yeah. statement? Oh yes, oh yes. yeah, yeah. All of your um, when you apply for that, you have to write all those things down. And if you wanted to be one of those other kinds of churches that we spoke of before, that's super heavy, then you have to give them an entire religion. Really? Yeah. Whoa. You have to give it to them and they look at it. I don't know who gets to choose whether or not that's a deal or not. Yeah. Because, you know, there's a Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. That's mm. a real thing. That's it's cool. It's a real church. Okay. <laughs> and that's that's cool, you know? Yeah. You should have that because, you know, those wow. guys challenge a lot of religious-based um, decisions in mm. government. Wow. You know? So does the... Uh, the satanic church says the same thing. Mm-hmm. They challenge those decisions that are made um, in government based on religion. And they're like, but what about our religion? Uh-huh. We're a religion also. Yeah. So Wow. Which is a little bit of trickery. That's very clown okay. to do something like that. I wish I did more digging into church and the idea of a church, but that's I guess we okay. could do that some other time. We can talk about church. We can talk about clown. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, mm. that's, that, that's, that's what fascinated me about the research into your background is 
just how one of the questions that I thought of was how people gravitate towards this kind of lifestyle I guess did you have parents that were performers did you no no my parents um, were midwesterners weird ones I mean for the midwest but my dad was a mechanical engineer and an oil painter and kind of an inventor Mm -hmm. and my mom was in her youth a sharpshooter and then when she was older she like took care of three kids she raised three kids we lived in the country 11 miles from a street light in the woods at a lake in an old stone house that was like a hundred and some years old when we moved in you know <clears throat> but they weren't um, into that kind of stuff but they supported me I gravitated towards theater really early I wanted to do in fourth grade, I was in Stone Soup. That was our class play. And after that, I was like, I want to be in plays. And then um, I was in a lot of... We had a really great theater program at our little town's public school. And all through high school, then I was in theater. And then I went to university on a theater scholarship. And then I went to a small um, college that was run by nuns. And I, I'm not Catholic, but I really dig nuns because they're members of, a, of an order. Right. Like Jedi. It yeah. Was like, I could go study with the nuns. And they would bring in these Benedictine monks to teach us fencing and stuff. Like, it was really cool. And then they got sports teams, and it became way less interesting. But yeah. before that, they, you know, were just... Um, the university now they're called the University of St. Mary they used to be called St. Mary College and I had a great theater instructor there named Van Ibsen and uh, we did all kinds we had to do every part of theater his deal was that you had to be able to make the sets write the shows Mm. every bit of it if Mm -hmm. it wasn't DIY I mean we did regular Shakespeare and stuff like that but um, he was really into teaching you how to do it for yourself so when I graduated um well, even before I graduated, I started studying mime at this place that used to exist called the School for Mime Theater, and it was in Gambier, Ohio, uh, at Kenyon College. Kenyon? Yeah. Kenyon College. And that, that went for 30 years they had that school, and I went from being a student there to eventually I was a teacher there, and we learned French and Polish mime, and... And we studied with Marcel Marceau. He came there and was our teacher. He was like in his 70s. Yeah. Um, I was 18. I was the youngest mime student at the school for okay. a long time. And then uh, there's a Polish mime master, Stefan Nijakowski. He came there and trained us. And so we really immersed ourselves in like how everything moves, like every tiny bit of movement that you could do with your body in an expressive way. Wow. Yeah, and it was that was great, and that that was cool for a long time. Uh huh. And th- I met a lot of other mimes there, you know. Yeah, yeah. That wow. Was... And you just built up your 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 entire network, yeah. starting there. Yeah, we just started making shows, and we would tour them to schools. Mm-hmm. So for two or three years, I lived on the road and did three shows a day, every day at different schools, and we would do uh, mime shows. And then I eventually moved to Chicago because they have even more theater, right? Okay. More cool stuff. It's a big theater town. And Lots of different stuff there. Your, your, your parents saw this, saw that you were interested at a very young age, and was there any resistance at all, or was it all just support? Well, I mean, they're cool. They would support me and everything, but I could tell that my dad thought it was a little weird. He would come to plays sometimes, you know, after he worked hard all day. Like, he was a blue-collar guy, you know. He worked at a factory and built machines and stuff. He would come to a place. Sometimes he'd fall asleep. He's into that stuff, though. I mean, when we were little, he would teach us. He would teach us how to uh, transform ourselves. He would be... He was really into Lon Chaney, and he would be like, watch this movie with Lon Chaney. And I don't know if you've ever seen a Lon Chaney movie, but Lon Chaney is physically and everything about his appearance he would transform himself for these different roles if you and he also he played a lot of clowns mm. um which if i had seen those movies maybe i wouldn't have ever become a clown because they're really weird okay but um lon cheney was like a like a star in like the horror genre uh-huh. of films but my dad was really into that he would help us really get into our costumes for halloween and 
he does it now now he's like into masons a lot uh-huh. he's a freemason okay and they do all kinds of rituals and plays and he's really into it like he has like multiple wigs and outfits and makeup and prosthetic noses and you know okay he's into that yeah thing and i found pictures of him where he was a clown when he was younger uh-huh he was really big though he was like the size of a volkswagen wow he had, like a giant mattress folded around him. I mean, he was he was a Shriner clown, but he was so huge. I don't know how he could do anything. There's no way he could do anything. It's yeah. just a deal that he showed up, I guess. So your dad is like of your stature, like oh, you're, yeah. you're tall. Build. Yeah, yeah, same build. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, kind of funny to be. I mean, I always thought I was I was small and skinny when I was little, so I don't really experience myself as a bigger person. Yeah. Yeah. But um. No, you're athletic stock yeah 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 i was like the little skinny dude that wasn't allowed to do everything interesting so sports didn't interest you at all when you were younger only ones that you don't have to be on a team okay yeah i remember you mentioned wrestling in a previous yeah we i we didn't have wrestling at school but we were into it we thought that was cool yeah i liked pole vaulting i don't know i wasn't really all that extroverted i was like you know the Myers Briggs test, that weird test you can take. Okay. That like yeah. the CIA will give yeah. you, or, uh-huh. or a college might give you. It's like this psychological test. Yeah. I took that test and I scored exactly the same, twenty years apart. Whoa. The test the same exact number. Uh huh. On the test, and I was. It's exactly the middle between extroverted and introverted. I land on that exact middle line. Really. So like sports. I didn't. I like. I mean, I like theater, but then you're in control of what's happening. Oh. There's an element of playing on a team where you're not as much in control of what's happening. <sighs> wow. Eventually, I had to get used to it for clown because I mean, that's the whole deal is that you go with what's happening. That's yeah. the performance form that the audience is included, and in. anything can happen. Yeah. So it's improv and all the mimetic world and invisible world, and you're playing a character that's based on your own insecurities and your own flaws and your own maybe not so favorable parts are what you make humor out of right so you found that at an at an early age well i just liked it yeah and i had to keep studying and studying and like i could go for the rest of my life and i won't know enough about those things there's no way to know that's why it's cool and they're sacred is the other thing like I'm really into like how in different cultures clowns are sacred and they they have a mission like they're trying to play with you and draw you out Mm -hmm. into a world where you're more integrated and I I want that for myself right so I want to play with other people in that way to be more drawn out into the world and more present you have to be ultra super present uh-huh. when you perform a show like that compared to like a regular play mm-hmm. like i could phone in a performance in a play but you can't ever do that mm. in a clown show mm-hmm. and you shouldn't really do that in a play but i mean you people do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you can't do that in a clown show you can't escape you're live with them in a way that there's no there's no backing out you know yeah. you're in a dance with the audience you have to be be present yeah yeah, yeah. totally um and you're also breaking down your own personal barriers, which is what I like and what I would love to focus on. But before you did that, before you even stepped on a stage to, I mean, you're, you are making money during yeah. these performances, yeah. right? Yeah, when I was touring, I lived. That's how I survived. All my friends got out of college and they were like, I can't find a job. And I'm like, man, I wish I didn't have so many. Jo- I have yeah. three shows a day every day and I live on the road. I'm like, I'm coming through your town. Yeah. And that people were always like, how do you survive like that? Like, yeah. how is that a real thing that anybody could do? And it, th- it just is a job, you know? And then for years, I supported myself just as a clown teacher. And I started... Um, clown lab here in san francisco and train people in mime and clown and you know you can make a pretty good living like that you're just always hustling to fill up your classes and like any of those theater companies i mean based on my experience before you make a decision like that to to commit especially financially if you're going to be dependent on it for for food shelter and all the basic needs there has to be some kind of like breaking point right was there 
like, oh, I'm going to do this. I, I think yeah, I, Yeah, I was know? scared when I was in my 20s. It's awful being in your 20s, I think, because there's this big buildup that you got it. You're going to get out of school and then everything's going to happen. You're going to have this life. And then yeah. when it happens, you're like, oh, my God, I have to super hustle. Like, mm-hmm. I'm part of a capitalist world. It's moving. It's moving. You got to move with that. And, and then I was like, but I want to be a performer. And. Um, and nobody or everyone around you is like, that's a ridiculous, you're going to die, dude. You'll never live. Right. And this guy I met who is a mentor of mine, he's a, he's a clown and physical theater guy and just one of the most knowledgeable guys about this stuff. His name is Steven Chips. Mm -hmm. We made some shows together and toured together a lot. He was like a mentor of mine. And he Mm -hmm. would say, he just said to me one time, I was like, how am I going to survive? And what if I don't do this? And I was like really worried. And he said, he said, you know, God feeds the sparrows. So how are you any different than that? He's like, you're part of a system that's already happening. Okay. How would you not survive? If you just did it, if you actually did it, do you think it's valuable? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, do you think other people would find it valuable? And I was like, yeah. He's like, then just focus on that. Wow. That's amazing. And you can kind of squeak by. I mean, I even raised a family, you know, teaching clown and stuff. And, you know, and now I'm teaching at a school where I get to teach clown and all the kind of movement things <laughs> all at once. But that's a more, um, that's a more like legit gig, I yeah. guess you could say. Was there a specific moment that reinforced your, like, this is what I want to do and I, I don't want to experience what's on the other side if I don't do it? Well, I would just regret it. And yeah. then I would try to quit all the time. Try I'd be to like, quit. wow, I'm not going to, I'm not doing any more performance stuff. <laughs> For a while I was like, I'm just going to be a fireman. And then, then I was thinking about that. I was going to drop out of college halfway through, not do theater anymore, just be a fireman. And then I thought about what my life would look like later on, how sad I would be that I didn't yeah. do the thing that I really liked, wow. that I really wanted to do. Yeah. You know? I think the... What you said was pretty valuable in how performance brings out... You're kind of doing this dance between what's uncomfortable, what's comfortable, and through that, you're developing something in yourself yeah. that, that you hope um, gets better along the way. And you said, like you said, it's infinite. You're never going to find Yeah, that you, you can't. You're huh. always figuring out, or at least for me, I'm always figuring out... I can only speak for myself, but I'm, I'm always figuring out, like what am I doing? What's my relationship to the universe? You know, and that's how you find it. For me, you can find it through clown. And like, I was really into the, the Hopi and the Indians, know, Hopi. Yeah. Indians, so. The Hopi tribe and they have the Koshari. And, um, I really like the clowns in their culture. We made a whole show called Kaput, and we were um, inspired by the Native American Hopi and Zuni tribes to create a clown that's job was to satirize mankind and to point out your foibles and whatever you know. And um, they, they, in their in their culture, they actually have a clown that has a cell phone and a purse, and it's called White Girl. And it just like is like talking sass on the phone, you know. Like they'll make fun of anything, and that's that's another thing that's weird in the world right now. Like you, there are consequences to making fun of things, you know. But humor traditionally is like a space where you could pretty much say whatever you want. Yeah. But there's consequences, you know. You're gonna you might get slapped at the Oscars, or the king beheads you. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't make a joke. There are consequences. Sometimes it's not gonna just. You're not protected. I just want to say that humor is a dangerous business. Uh, you shouldn't. Uh-huh. It shouldn't be safe. It shouldn't be safe for anyone. Ooh. The people being lambasted or the people saying the things. Okay. You know, like it shouldn't be totally safe because it's inherently not. Like people always ask me because a clown. Like, are you afraid of clowns? Aren't you afraid of clowns? Sure. And I'm like, no, because clown for me is a verb. You clown how you sit or how you stand or how you speak or what kind of relationship you have to the character that you're playing it's bigger than just what you look like or you have a nose or you slapped some makeup on you know that's just what clowns in the past did yeah so they could be abstract people but they were working in situations where there's poor lighting Mm -hmm. you know you can become an abstracted person 
you know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. every person, a lot of different ways, mm. you know, to be a comedic character. Abstracted person. Yeah, I always think of it like you're an abstract person. All oh, right, right. So you're not your physical form. Your physical form. Well, is I mean, I'm me, of... but I could change me oh. to where you know you want people to to know. Yeah. That you're putting on you're putting it on you're up to no good you want people to know yeah you don't want to trick them if you do that's a different <laughs> thing that's like Sasha Baron Cohen yeah, yeah 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 where you're but he's already putting it on so heavy but people still believe that he's these things yeah he's obviously not right a regular person in any of these guises that he takes and people still roll with it <laughs> like how far do you have to go before they realize that it's a ruse yeah it should be easy but it just isn't I I have a friend who I hung out with recently and, and she listens to this podcast, but she told me, and I freaked out after she told me this was <laughs> that sometimes she for kicks will dress up as another person knowing where her friends will be her group of friends. Like let's say it's at, at a bar for a birthday party. She'll put on a whole get up, spend lots of time with it, embody this persona and she'll show up to this bar. Oh, <laughs> yeah. She'll wow. show up. And she's spy on it. her friends? She, yeah. Not spy, but she'll like, like just stumble on them as like a drunk. Oh, or just wow. flirt with one of the girls as a man. You know, wow. she'll dress up as a man. And troll your friends yeah. dressed in, in costume. Yeah, and she won't tell Cosplay them. Cosplay troll your friends. Yes. <laughs> and she won't tell them until after. And she compl- and these wow. are friends that she's grown up with or has known for a very wow, long time. Wow, I want to meet your friend. That yeah, sounds like yeah. a really interesting person. Uh, yeah, I'll set that up. Right? I'll yeah, set, set that, that up. up. We'll meet in disguise. Yeah. Both yeah. of us will come disguised and not know. But I, I've been thinking about that lately, and I'm just thinking of what kind of changes that have to go on internally externally for people to completely forget who you are like i know you as a certain person right i've known you as a certain person but you show up and and you're not dan anymore you're not yeah you're you're completely you know the weird thing about that is the weird thing about that from an actor's perspective is like when i was a really young actor i used to think oh my god how am i going to become another person that's not me but you don't you Mm. you're you as if you were them. Ah. So you're making choices as if you were them. Yeah. But you're you drawing on everything about you and everything that you know. Mm-hmm. So you're still you, very strongly you. You're you as if you were. Yeah. And we, it's hard for people, they think about acting as like this total transformation that you're a different person. And it, it, it's a, a barrier, it's a block. You know, uh, to be you as if you were this other person for me is more freeing because then I can make all kinds of different choices. Interesting. And, and I have to remember that it's a play. You know, it is literally play. Yeah. I have to play as if I'm this thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As you. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it has to be play because the spirit of play where it's fun like when you're really playing and you really play a game you're fully in it Mm -hmm. and if you're in it that hard when you're pretending to be someone else it's very easy i mean we were just saying how easy it is for saucer baron cohen to fool people into thinking he's a completely different person when he's obviously a person in disguise yeah and you were saying earlier too you're you're introverted and extroverted you're kind of dancing in in between both yeah i I am okay I'm not all the way extroverted. I meet people that are extroverted, really extroverted, right. and I'm like, wow, wow, okay. that's impressive. Okay, that's Could, impressive. I would have never guessed I that. I couldn't about you <laughs> do that all that way like that. I'm, I'm. No, it's awkward. I like social gatherings where I have a reason to be there. I have a job to do. Okay. Like if I just go, sometimes I go to like festivals when it's like, I went once to a festival of families and it's like all these families and all their kids and all their kids are just running around as a you know, mob of kids. And then there's all the parents and they're like all talking and, and I was wandering around for a while and then I went up and there was a way that you could um, sign up to do a shift in the kitchen. 
and I did that mm -hmm. and I was hanging out with the people in the kitchen but because we're working doing something right yeah. it becomes funny and yeah. and there's already like an expectation like the play is already written the plot what happens right. is already written and then we can improvise within that to have fun and I find that that's lacking in a lot of social environments you know people want to play Truly. horseshoes or that beanbag toss thing or frisbee you know like doing I want to do something yeah or sometimes people just eat and munch on things the whole time that they're yeah, in the I mean, gathering yeah gosh I would I would nervously eat like an entire buffet if yeah. I had to be yeah. at an event like okay. that it would be dangerous <laughs> I'd be like oh I have to go to the hospital Whoa. yeah so now I realized as an adult once I became older that I have a, a degree of social anxiety now you're listening to the one two three so you over there what better move your feet put your hands together it's start to clap is there a baseline of people that are attracted to we're gonna focus on i guess clown clown uh, or theater theater or performances theater uh a lot of yeah. theater people are really extroverted and a lot of improvisers are really extroverted, like more more than me. I'm I notice. Wow. Even teachers, you know. Um, yeah, I'm a real fence sitter in okay. that world. I'm like in and and also like hee hee up you over here. I'm the same way. Um, yeah, I have <laughs> yeah. to go and like recharge, have those hours of like no people. Um, Especially when you're on tour, like you do three shows a day, you're on all day, and then when you go to your hotel, you do nothing. You right. you literally you have to veg, or you can't get up and do it again. You know, for an entire school year. Yeah. So now that I'm teaching out of school, I notice that same rhythm. Yeah. I feel the same way too. I teach multiple classes during the day, and then I want to go home and hide. Teachers are amazing. They should get so much money. I know. Teachers. Uh -huh. should be like the first line of people that we pay in the world they're literally helping young people form their characters yes as a good person yeah and they're not that highly paid mm -hmm. you know they should be paid way higher than somebody who makes an app on your phone so you can like find special fruit or whatever <laughs> like I'm not I just can't even believe <laughs> that humanity and just just the humanities mm. i mean just think about this at universities they're kind of like like shutting down the study of humanities and like afterthoughts feeding off you know taking away draining off like studying humanities so that you understand the human person better like that's where your real growth is going to come from right you're going to become more than you were instead of just practical mm -hmm. practical arts you know, <laughs> like I love it. I want people to do a whole bunch of things for no reason. Like, okay. just do a lot. Everybody, if anyone hears this, if, if the five people that hear this <laughs> go out in the world and they just do a bunch of things for no reason and they don't explain them to anyone, that would be great. Mm. Paint yourself green, go outside, right. don't answer any what questions. What would that do? What, just, would, what would painting yourself green do just, for people? It would, it would become a reality breaker for people that saw you and didn't get an explanation and you just did it because that's what culture is yeah you know? they're like what but why but why are you green on a tuesday right outside why like yeah you have to have those things in your culture reality bonkers right and i'm so glad that uh you know i came across somebody like you at this stage in my life where I'm starting to feel like I need to accept a little bit more playfulness and joy into my life. Uh, and that takes a lot of, you know, I'm kind of teetering on the, all the time between introvert, introversion and extroversion. Mm -hmm. And it always takes like a breaking point of just saying, fuck it. Yeah. I'm just yeah, going to do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh my God. It's so scary in some ways when how clown is taught um, in a European tradition and I like this exercise also to have the clowns just just take the space. Just come into the space. So you just walk out in front of the group and okay. you're seen by the group and the group sees you and you see them and you deal with what 
happens when that happens. So at first, I mean, of course, everybody kind of shuts down and then I coach them and yell at them and throw things at them or whatever. I had a teacher that literally did throw things at you in okay. that moment, but it wasn't useful. It was a bad choice. But to get, to get you into the place where you're comfortable and with the group and then you start to notice that you have certain impulses toward the larger group. And then when you follow those impulses, you start to create humor. Mm. And, and we start to laugh the more you tell the truth and then you keep telling the truth about what it's really like for you to be in that situation <laughs> and people yeah. keep laughing at you more and more it's pretty crazy following okay following the impulse yeah like what's your impulse in any given moment like mm-hmm. like do you ever like have contrary impulses like when you stand on the edge of something you're like I should jump off I could jump off right oh, now. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. People have that one a lot, like uh, about high places. They won't jump off, thank no. God, but they they notice. Yeah. Or like um, when I'm at an event that uh, I was at an event the other day and a colleague was there. And I was like, I could run away right now and drive away. I should just drive away right now. I could, I could go now. Okay. And they were like, but Dan... <laughs> Why? I was like, because I could, I could drive away now. And it's just kind of my contrary nature, you know? Like, yeah. Clowns I, are traditionally born out of kind of a contrary nature. Right. Would you say it's kind of like just the boredom with the regular regularity of any given situation? And you're maybe. entertaining that thought just to entertain yourself and stimulate your own yeah, mind. Yeah, maybe yeah. that you're bored. Maybe, not, <laughs> maybe it's because you're bored a little that you want to like... I just want to see what happens. I, yeah. I have to stick my finger in all the pies. I have to do, you know, it's just poor impulse control. <laughs> right, right, right. Poor it's impulse. bad socialization, bad education. No. No, it's good. It's a good thing. Yeah, and to go back to what you mentioned about the teachers, with the school that we work for, it seems like these children are very, are given something intrinsic about them maybe even realizing that there is an intrinsic world and that they're able to look at adults in the eye like adults normally don't do as adults. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I never really considered that about our school. I, I don't know what it is. I realize, but when you say it, I, I that rings really true for me. I'm used to teaching adults and teaching at like a collegiate level where everyone's kind of peers in a way. Yeah. Even though you're the teacher, you still... Everyone's sure. equal, but it's true at our school. Um, even the smallest children just see the adults like, "Hey, what's up?" Inquisitive, yeah, in that sense, yeah, yeah. And they're like, they're not like, "Oh, the grown-ups, I should ignore them, or mm-hmm. they don't want to pay attention to me, or yeah." It's, but we work in a magic place, magic place, yeah, <laughs> totally. In the Bay, there yeah. are a lot of amazing progressive schools, and we get to work at one of them. Mm. But that was one of the surprises that I stumbled upon in researching for this conversation was the the School of Physical Theater. I'm so amazed by, or fascinated by this. I want to hold some regular classes. Uh, I have a lot of students that want to study mime. Mm. Like just the mimetic realm gives you full use of your body in a way that you don't normally have yeah what uh, is what is the mimetic realm yeah, what's the purpose God. of that because some people i just watched the anthony bourdain documentary yesterday oh. and there was a mime that was at like a park i don't know what country he was in but he was just like get me away immediately you i don't want to be like away. It. i don't want to be around well it. so sometimes why are people, people freak out about mimes well here's the whole deal marcel marceau became really famous as a mime people started to emulate Marceau's form of mime, which is kind of like a pantomime, not in the British sense of a pantomime, which is a totally different thing, but Mm -hmm. pantomime like a guy doing invisible stuff outside. And because people are doing that outside, where it's not really supposed to be in a way, they're taking a theatrical art form and like throwing it outdoors and saying, now you're doing it outside. And, And this guy who comes up and is sitting at the table watching you He's not complicit in what you're doing. He didn't agree to that. Mm. And so, like, people would have the same reaction if there were ballet dancers running down the street doing ballet in your face, (laughs) and you didn't ask for that. You'd be like, no. Do you want jugglers all the time? No. Yeah. You didn't ask for that. So, good outdoor performances are people that do a thing, and they stay in their own thing, and then you come over if you want to do it. You know? Like, there's a huge 
um, tradition in all of Europe, pretty much anywhere that's not America, of outside <laughs> performances. In America, it doesn't work the same way because people are way more fear-based in America and they're way more um, insulated and isolated um, and individualized in a way that it's not. Like in Europe, there's a there's a summer festival season that happens that starts in the top part of the region and works its way all the way down to the most southern regions wow. through the course of the summer. Mm-hmm. And every town has their own festival and it's outdoor things and there are performances. And I know a lot of clowns that make their whole living just doing that during the summer. Mm-hmm. And for the rest of the year, they just work on their show for next year. Mm-hmm. You know? um, the, the European festival circuit is a rich thing. Um, it doesn't really happen in the U.S. It started to take off some in the 70s mime and things like that. But then there's a kind of um, maybe kind of like maybe poorly trained or, or just people just trying to just do it going outside. And they have like a f- like fake innocence, hmm. like a feigned innocence. If you're like, uh, yeah, 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 you know yeah, 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 I'm talking about? I have to Over do it top. so you can tell. Yeah. Um, and that kind of feigned innocence, I thought a lot about it. Like people really hate that and I realize why is like if I pretend that that reality is like this like sappy like ultra fake world I'm insulting you that you exist Mm. I'm saying I'm really mocking your very existence and I I'm with the people that would be like please don't do that I don't want to be around that you know Uh, clowns have to be careful how they they have to be trained and they have to be nuanced and intelligent people that know how to play with someone and you have to invite them into a game and then they join the game and then you can play with them (laughs) all you want you don't want to crash somebody's world or like yeah like street performers that make their whole thing by kind of like making fun of people that don't want to play that's Uh, never going to work you know you need people that want to play Wow! and you want to hold them up Mm-hmm. You know, you want to play with them and tease them a little bit, but you want to ultimately hold them up. Like that's Keep what you're playing. doing there. You're there to like, you know, create a kind of community and resilience, and you know, you're holding up humanity. Oh, you're supposed to be part of culture. Yeah. So, what was the, what was the internal metamorphosis? You say it, it's not so much of a metamorphosis, but what changes needed to happen internally for you to be comfortable with sharing your performative um, aspirations or your just your performances in general? I'm not sure, but I know that it changes over time. Yeah. Because when I was younger, I was desperate to get audiences to watch me have certain kinds of performances and then I actually went to graduate school and studied experimental performance and like so you could just do whatever you want to do you you literally can get a group of people to pay close intelligent attention to whatever that you're creating yeah and so you get to examine that and now I'm a little bit older I'm 52 and I just made a show called Gast- Gastro Absurdo that's yeah. about a chef. <laughs> and um, I've only performed it one time. I did it in a theater for about 1,500 people. And I filmed it. And you can look at it on YouTube if you want to. Just look up mm. my name or look up Gastro Absurdo. And it's all, the material, some of it's there. It's all in process. I'm still building a lot of it, but... For me to want to show them that is, is a playful urge. I want mm-hmm. to play with them. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to create ways to play with them, mm-hmm. you know, or mm-hmm. in public or in, um, sometimes we do clowning at like refugee camps and places like that, like for Clowns Without Borders or, you know, just on our own missions that mm-hmm. we make. Yeah. You know, yeah. that same thing is a, you want to connect. It's really about connection. You're trying to connect. Mm, you know? Why right. do any play? I ask myself this all the time. Why do we tell each other stories? Why tell anyone a story about anything that happened? Okay. You know, like if you came up and you said, man, this morning I was out doing this thing. This thing <laughs> happened. Why, why would you tell that story? That's a great question. Why do you tell, what's the answer that you, I, you come up with? I'm not sure. Uh-huh. Um, We tell stories to other people because it's affirming. 
right? They, they affirm part of our reality, but why certain stories? Why do we tell ourselves in the, in the film industry so many stories right. about good versus evil? Yeah. Why are there only two sides? Mm. Why isn't it more nuanced than mm. that, mm-hmm. right? Why isn't it the good guy was mostly good, but he was kind of bad? You know, I love those kind of stories where mm. it's more nebulous. Like, there was a, the television show right. Breaking Bad. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Right. I don't know. Yeah. Um, certain old cowboy westerns. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Truly. I mean, that kind of stuff made Clint Eastwood famous. Mm-hmm. Is he a bad guy? He's dirty hairy. He's bad. That's bad. Yeah. But he's a good guy, right? Mm. Or even Justice. The stories that we tell ourselves are curated by someone who decides yeah. to fund that story. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of stories that could be told that aren't being told about communities and people and and people not every story has to have an awful thing happening, you know. Right. I mean, you can't make a story out of like guy eats a sandwich, masturbates, and goes to sleep. That's not a good movie, right? <laughs> no, I mean it kind of got a, It's a fringe movie that some people would like, <laughs> yeah. but that's just not a movie. It has to be like guy eats a sandwich, was gonna masturbate, but aliens attacked and vaporized his, his house. He's running down the street, right? It has to be like desperate. <laughs> And maybe there's some other stories that doesn't have to be that way. I mean, mm. do we just do that to titillate our, you know, apeness? So we're like, oh yeah, my my animal part is like turned on now because they're being eaten. Mm. You know, why do we watch horror movies and create these things? They tell us things about mm. ourselves as creatures, you know? Mm. Sports. There's a winner and a loser. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, just even the beautiful ballet bodies in sports like the things the human body can accomplish yeah like that's that's huge right you know i used to be like boo sport ball but now i'm like no i i see the value of yeah i like teams i like to see a team do a thing that i like Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. it's performance art i think yeah it is i mean they work so hard i mean I think we're talking on a no. I know we're talking on a day where the Warriors are parading through Market Street oh right god. now. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, so amazing. Yeah, too, right. But I was just thinking of you know whether you're a clown or an actor or an athlete. There's work that has to go into it. So much work. So much. The body has to be the the body and mind have to be kind of. In unison, yeah, athletes for, like you were saying, really performances have to integrate their their mind and their body in a yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, physical theater performers are like that too. They they train all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, most of my students are circus performers, and they they might do a circus act, but they want it to have something people want to look at. You know, mm. like sometimes I. Sometimes I teach at San Diego Circus Center, or I used to run the Clown Conservatory here at the San Francisco Circus Center, and training the students in je, in play. Je. Yeah, like French for play. Okay. So it's just like, does your act have je? Like, do you come on stage and do you just perform a like a perfunctory like <laughs> like trick? Like, look at my <laughs> trick I trained so hard to do. No one wants to watch that. Okay. And maybe in a fascist world where we're like, all hail you who are so strong and, you know. But if yeah. there's no play to it, there's no humanity to it, so nobody really wants to watch it. It kind of falls uh, flat. You know? Je. Yeah, you want some play. Yeah. You gotta teach play. Wow. I feel like that's my real job at the school. Uh-huh. And really everywhere, at Clown Lab and for Church of Clown, I'm, we're trying to create play. Play is the human glue that glues humans together. They right. want to play. And we- you're supposed to play a lot, and you don't <laughs> get to. It's tragic. I, I'm curious to know, since you're in the middle, right, between an introvert and extrovert, so there, I'm sure there are times where you kind of tighten up, and there are times, of course, where you loosen up, oh, like I've yeah. seen. So... What is your, I guess, what is your observation when you see somebody that doesn't have that play aspect in them? Well, just I mean, it's to, a judgment, right? Just but, trying to draw people out. 
Mm. You know, you either go towards your center or away from your center. Yeah. And if you're threatened, you go more towards your center. You might be not want to come out. And you don't want somebody to make you come out because that doesn't work. No. I mean, because your parasympathetic nervous system kicks in when you're threatened and then you can't think. Mm -hmm. You can't improvise. You can barely breathe. You really think that you're dying, essentially. Yeah. But as a clown, you learn to like... to kind of dampen your body's ability to turn that on or you turn it on and you learn how to like deal with it being on and the fact that you're like kind of in a th- what is a threatening situation you're working with it you're using it like fuel yeah. it becomes your ability to adapt in a high stress situation you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you have to be chill in the midst of the fire so how do you feel that you've grown over the years as a performer like what needed to happen along the way for you to be where you are now yeah. wow when you when you say it like that I think like I should be somewhere mm. <laughs> like I yeah, should yeah, yeah. where am I I'm <laughs> the same place I always was um, I taught a ton of students and I feel like every single time that I helped them I also taught myself something for sure that and I used to be paralyzed by that experience of being in, in front of a group or with a group or like in a play. It was paralyzingly terrifying to me. And now I can roll with what happens. I can let things not work yeah. on stage enough to see where the opening is to make them work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I can sit in the thing that's not working over yeah. and over until I find out to all of us together like that doesn't work and then like oh the thing yeah um which is like just staying there long enough faith that's what i think i have more faith faith yeah not like faith in god or faith in something i have faith in that everything is happening as it should hmm or at least faith that faith that you're gonna find there's openings chaos cracks yeah. In, the, in the chaos yeah. for light and learning it's everywhere it's everywhere if you're not tripping yeah I always think uh, when I was in Thailand once they would go around uh, there's these cars that drive around in Bangkok to advertise like uh, boxing mm-hmm, things mm-hmm. and the guy's got these speakers all over the top of his car and it's like don't miss don't miss Thai <laughs> boxing uh, don't miss uh. yeah. and it's like you know um and I always hear that stupid speaker, but it's like, don't trip. Like, don't uh, trip when things are happening. During I, your performance, you'll well, hear that. Just all, a lot in life wow. for this past maybe 10 years uh, when things uh-huh. are happening. I'm still going to trip. I mean, yeah. I'm still going to freak out and be like, ah, the thing is all messed up. Because yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, hopefully that stays in my head. Wow. That's what I, that's what I observed when... I saw your gas, gastro absurdo gastro absurdo performance. Yeah, because you see the moments where it's not working. No, I cannot. Oh, no, I cannot God. because it's all I'm, over it. What I'm at, what I, what I was thinking was like, if anything is going wrong, especially in experimental or clown performance, there's. Uh, the crowd has no expectations. You can't have expectations in a spirit in an experimental performance yeah. or a clown show. You don't know clown what's show. Happen. You don't know what's yeah. gonna happen. So it's easy to kind of mask the. I guess when you feel like it's not going as planned, you know. Yeah, there's Is a little right? bit of there's a little bit of leeway. Yeah, I mean the clowns that are trained that saw that performance just brought me pages of notes. Whoa! They were like, <laughs> yeah. They were like, okay, when you do this, that's too fast, and you gotta, you know, this moment, you have to. Some of my mentors um, saw that show. Um, the guy I used to run the clown conservatory with, he was the head of the clown conservatory. Joe Diefenbacher. I was his associate director. He immediately was like, okay, this, 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 and this. You have to do these things. But he's, you know, been doing it for years. He plays that circuit I was talking about in Europe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But just finding ways to to hide that moment. It's wow. a glorious moment when it's not okay. happening well. <laughs> and and you're like there and you're like in it and you're like, oh, this is not working. Oh, and shit. you stay there. Uh-huh. And you can't panic. You just have to 
roll with it. It affects your life. That it's true. It's a kind of faith that things will turn out okay. Wow. I mean, I teach my daughter the, all of these ridiculous lessons that I learned from all of these things and that are saying that we say to each other when we're freaking out about something, when we're tripping, is even the end of the world isn't the end of the world. Right. Even the end of the world is not the end of the world. Mm. Because the end of the world is an external thing. And it doesn't have to be the end of the world. You could stand at the actual end of the world and be like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm witnessing the end of the world. Mm. You know? Is that what you feel like resilience yeah, is? Yeah, I think that's what resilience is. If through humor. That's humor how you can is find resilience. It. You can find it. You got to have a sense of humor about yourself. I mean, if you take yourself really seriously, that's pretty funny, too. You know? <laughs> If you take, I mean, that's a great place to start off. One of my first clowns I ever made was like really mean, demanding, didn't have a sense of humor about I themselves at all. One. Just yeah. such a jerk clown. When I was in Kaput, we had a show called Kaput that we toured all over the United States for a couple of years to big theaters. Mm. We played in New York right after 9-11. Wow. We played the what Philadelphia a- French Fest the day after the planes hit the towers. And like in our show, oh, we form an airplane that shoots down the Red Baron. And when we did it in our show, everyone stood up and saluted. And we're like trying to do a satire of war. But suddenly we've become the pro-war answer to the thing because of the climate. And, uh-huh. and the material didn't change the world changed yeah and we were like oh now we have to change our material yeah because you know, we're trying to satirize war we're not trying to be like the go get them boys you know kind yeah. of thing yeah yeah but that's how the audience took it they all stand up stood up and saluted <laughs> like you were pro war yeah they were like you yeah, shot them down good job yeah, yeah, get yeah, them yeah, yeah, we were yeah. like oh we don't want to say that wow yeah wow so how do you how do you how do you plan to teach that resilience? Because that's what I really talk about a lot on the podcast is how do we how do we how do we get back to that resilience of self sufficiency? I heard recently that like resilience became a bad word because it's like telling communities like just be resilient. We're not even going to help you. Um, but I'm just keeping my words like clown. It's a bad word. You don't want to say clowns. Okay. You know. But I'm going to say we can say resilience anyway. Because sure. we're just gonna, you yeah. know, we don't have to listen to that. No. <laughs> Bay Area twaddle. We just don't have to listen to it. Um, which is what everybody in the Bay is doing. They're like, we're not listening. That's why it's a hotbed for innovation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, you got to have a sense of humor about yourself. You know, sometimes we get hired. I've been hired by like big companies to go in with like the, the top executives and help them make fun of each other and make fun of themselves because they forgot they're too powerful nobody's they don't have a jester yeah you know and you have to be really careful when you take jobs like that because they you know they're not gonna like it yeah necessarily everybody likes to be made fun of a little bit i hate it i i don't want to be roasted i don't want to have any kind of thing no i mean if i went to a clown show and the clowns teased me i'd be okay with that yeah but i don't want to have more than that yeah it's not i'm not trying to do that to anyone else either i would be like don't do that to them unless they ask you to have you ever had a kid like yell at you this year kids at school yeah no they don't yell at me i think i'm scary you're scary maybe i mean they like me i'm kind of a benevolent sort of old dad figure uh-huh. Uh-huh. they don't yell at me but they um they're kind of snarky sometimes i like to be the kind of authority that you can sass a little bit sure i don't want to be the authority that it's like ironclad i'm like what'd you say yeah kids? yeah everybody yeah, yeah. 20 push-ups you know like <laughs> i don't want to be that person like yeah. i have a part of me an inclination where you know i would do that like like where they try to give the ring in Lord of the Rings, they try to give the ring to Gladriel and okay. she turns into like the dark image of what she would be if she had the ring. I mean, everybody has that part of them. Yeah. But I like to be the kind of authority that you can mess with. Okay. It's part of teaching clown. You, 
there's a, a, a part in the trajectory of training clowns where they're clowns and they're in their thing and you become the authority and you start trying to boss them. Mm. And then they, they thwart authority and like you get real nasty with them and they, they, they won't, they won't, wow. they won't come to, you know, wow. heal. They're not going to, they're not going to, they're not going to listen anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of when you know you did it, you did it well. If they get scared and they, and they, they cow away, you know, then you know you didn't Mm-mm. raise them. I've seen groups of clowns reach this one point and then teachers try to um, play this authority with them and the clowns not understand, including me, I did not understand that it was okay to mess with them. They mm-hmm. didn't create that opening, the teachers that I had. Yeah, yeah. And so we were all just like shut down. We're like, oh, well, they hate us. We're bad. You yeah, know, we didn't yeah. do well. Uh, but if you do it right, you can be like, even in your voice, like even the kids, you could be like, nobody stands over here for the next 25 seconds because this is my backyard. You get out of here. They already know <laughs> that you're a dink and they should be yeah, doing that yeah. and they dive all over yeah, you. Know, they, yeah. You have to, um, you, you have to clown yourself. Mm-hmm. You can't be a real scary authority. That's a drama. Uh, you know, same with the clowns. They can't show you their bad parts that's a drama they have to make fun of themselves in french it's so beautiful in french they say and and i don't speak french well but i do understand this if i'm in in french if i want to say i make fun of you i say je me moque de, de toi je me moque de toi which means i make fun of myself to you Ooh. and that's the best definition of clown i've ever heard okay i make fun of myself to you i'm like Ooh, i'm like this and yeah like, yeah and that makes you go oh your defenses are down you know you'll you'll come in you'll join the group right 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 so how will you how do you handle when you're in social situations a person that is not willing to clown around like that if the you're barriers trying to clown are them if you're trying I mean in a class or like in just life in life I'd leave them alone Onions. if someone doesn't want to be played with I don't toy mm, with them just leave like Maybe, give them their space no you can yeah. tell if there's an opening you can like smell it if there's a chance and when I used to clown a lot in the hospitals I used to work for the Big Apple Circus um, in hospitals in Chicago and, and all kinds of like elder care facilities and places and you learn like sometimes I would be like I'm gonna bail I don't feel like they want us mm-hmm. you take the, it's called taking the temperature of the room oh, and now okay. I do it every day when I wake up I'm like what's the temperature of the world ah. take the temperature of the world does it feel like a place that's you know and I would leave sometimes too early and some of the clowns I was that were more experienced that I was working with they would they would stay a little longer and I'd be like oh my god don't don't push their buttons you know and then and then the person would pop and they'd and they'd have fun and they would play and I'd be like wow you have so much courage wow to my partner when we would leave I'd be like wow you're so bold that uh-huh. you were willing to stay to risk the wrath of the person you know to play with them just enough to get them to come around you know it's wow. a delicate delicate dance have it you takes felt that training. wrath before oh, I've failed both ways I've yeah I've made all the possible mistakes. I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, you have to celebrate your mistakes. Uh People don't do that. You're not allowed to make mistakes. You should cover up the fact that you made a mistake. If you make a mistake, there's actually a game that I love where I make you make mistakes. And every time you make a mistake, you have to say hooray and jump up in the air and celebrate. And it's funny because kids will do it right away they're like yeah i made a mistake but when i teach that same game to college students they they're so hesitant to admit that they make mistakes so then i sometimes i stop the whole group and i just go around one at a time and make each person say i i completely failed i've i've ruined it I make them apologize for that they've just they've ruined it. Wow. And no matter what it is, I'm just oh. like you have to say it does there even even if there isn't anything, you have to say you have to convincingly convince us that you're legitimately sorry that you've made a terrible <laughs> mistake. And you can see the people that resist right away, they're like, Oh, I will not, you know. And then watching them try to confess yeah. to this thing is really funny. Wow, wow, wow. I wish I we had some grown-ups we could do this with right now. I would imagine that some of them break down and cry. Sometimes people do. Ooh. In clown school, when I was studying clown, 
clowns would be out sitting on the curb outside the school. I went to the Del Arte school and studied clown and we had a really tough teacher. And then years later I returned there and I got to be him. I got to teach the clown territory. And sometimes clowns just have the nose on their forehead <laughs> and they're just sitting on the street. They're like crying. Cause it, it's, um, it shows you, you so strongly. Yeah. You, know, you have to, but I mean, I wouldn't even, everybody's gonna have their own experience, but you know, you got to let yourself have a lot of slack to be a human in the world. Mm. You are a hunter gatherer ape. Mm hmm that suddenly got a lot smarter all of a sudden for like two million years you had the same six tools and then suddenly you had suddenly. 32 tools 64 tools oh, language all this stuff just yeah. suddenly happened to you and we're constantly trying to catch up with that mm -hmm. we haven't really caught up with that at all that way man i think somebody messed with us john mm. i think someone came along and went doink they did something to us because mm. we were the same for like two or three million years yep. nothing changed but, yeah i don't know i'm nerding out on that but no i love that. that came out mm -hmm. like for two million three million years nothing changed you have six tools everybody uses the six same six tools to do everything but once we got language we started going to different regions and every time we did all the large mammals went extinct because we ate them mm -hmm. we hunted them down killed them and ate them mm -hmm. which affected all the other animals and the birds and all that stuff changed every single place we've ever gone on earth we literally ate everyone yeah 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 which is nuts that's nuts i mean i read about uh, the soap root plant because there's some on San Bruno Mountain and I was just like oh soap root plant what does oh. this do other than make soap soapy you know film for us to wash our hands and what I read was that you could chuck the soap root plant in the river I, I'm pretty sure you have to make some kind of concoction and it'll paralyze fish <laughs> right <laughs> So you can eat them all. So you can eat them yeah. all. And it's illegal in, yeah. in Sacramento rivers and rivers all around California. But there was once an abundance of fish. That was That's the point that I'm trying to yeah. get at. Was there was once an abundance of fish that you could just throw soap root in and gather all these fish and eat to a certain all. point in the river, catch them and eat them all. But so cool. it's all gone. Well, not yet. <laughs> China Beach is it China Beach up north yeah mm, yeah China yep. Beach up north if you ever go there there's a museum to the um, people that used to do all the shrimping up there and stuff and they 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 said that it used to be so thick that you could almost walk yeah, on them, that yeah. they were so thick in the water and they fished them all out eventually yeah but it was like dense with with shrimp and stuff which is pretty incredible that's incredible yeah everything um elk uh yeah. wild turkey i yeah. don't know they roll everything. over though they it it, it comes in waves the mm. earth creates life in different ways mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you so many things have already passed and been extinct and gone and there's been whole extinction level events more than once right that wiped out all the things that were there then and then we got a whole new wave of wow. stuff wow so something wants to be here bad enough to continue to to come into this world yeah, yeah. some kind of force but now yeah you mentioned tools yeah humor is your tool would yeah. you say yeah for clown uh -huh. I mean, humor reflection Let's... play play probably play is the biggest one yeah even before humor because it doesn't have to be funny you just have to play i i thought about this image when you mentioned it earlier you said cl clowns outside of the school that you studied at and taught at <laughs> and it just felt I saw the image of a dejected clown that oh, has yeah. been just yeah. trying hard. Uh, <laughs> and not a lot of people uh, see that, right? But it takes a lot of work to... And you see, uh, when people try to be clowns with this idea that a clown is a noun, that you could be this thing, a clown. And what is a clown? Someone is funny. So in a class, when they get a chance to be on stage, they just try to be funny. And everybody knows how 
awful it is and awkward it is to watch someone try to be funny people that are actually being funny have like uh, studied a craft they're like figuring it out but even clowns just have to be curious and playful and they'll automatically elicit humor like humor can't be the thing you try to do like there was a clown once that um I was teaching in a class and my daughter was there and she was like three maybe and the clown was on stage and he couldn't get anyone to be on his side at all on stage because he would, didn't feel okay in himself mm-hmm. and he he stopped in a certain moment and I encouraged him just to ask everyone who's watching the thing that, that he's not saying is, which is like will you be my friend will you, will you be my friend because he seemed so desperate for them to, to like him yeah. which he has to give that up so I was like just ask them all and get it over with so he's like will you be my friend will you be my friend he went through everybody in the group and then he's like just to the just to the ether he's like will you be my friend and my daughter who was three was like no <laughs> she's like she's not not you know because <laughs> It just was um, not the thing, you know. Mm. That person really needed to to do the work without trying to get the. My teachers used to call it the biscuit. Stop working for the cookie. They'd be like, stop working for the cookie. Because if you're desperado, you just have this stink of like a desperate clown on yeah, stage. Like you're yeah. used to be like, oh. Unless you were conscious enough of that to make it your bit. Yeah. Which that's the only way out. That's, funny. that's the only yeah. way to escape that if you can't stop doing it. Uh huh. Is to know how to use it. Did he escape it by asking people? If I never saw friend? him escape it. Ooh, I never saw him escape it. Was it was one of those. He got slightly better. Yeah. But that's a longer process. Shit. You know, that's a longer thing. Wow. Process as in. Yeah, I mean, that person will do that for a while. Is he? A, you think he's just too attached to the fact that he needs to be funny? He's he, trying he to. He needs you to like it. Ah, uh, okay. You do it when you're on stage. It's for us, but you have to pretend that that's not the case. You do it. You're a thing that has to be its own thing. You can't come out and be like, is this okay? Yeah. You guys, did I wear the right pants to the show tonight? Shit. I mean, unless you made it your bit, which would be funny. I I mean, I'm just thinking about one of the bits that you had where you were dressed up as tanks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, you really did your research Dude, we, I had to, I did, had to Oh my god, we did this play where we were Generals sticking up out of the top of these tanks Soldiers then, in your cup Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, we're driving around <laughs> And um, we're dropping little army soldiers everywhere And this other character is in a burqa Trying to sweep up all the soldiers That are infiltrating their world and then, um, and then at one point the tanks, they, they both have guns, which are kind of positioned like right where your penis would be. And then the <laughs> tanks start, start doing it on stage. <laughs> These tanks start humping and the generals are riding in the tanks. And they're like, ah, war. And they're like humping like two tanks fucking on stage. And the audience, I remember looking out and seeing them and they were just, their mouths were just open. Like, you know, they were just like that we were always trying to create for a while like really satirical shocking work and in the kind of clown world that's in the Buffon category yeah that's the territory of Buffon where like where Sasha Baron Cohen works and that's like where it's beyond clown it's in a different hole shit this guy Jacques Lecoq um created these territories or defined these territories that people still use he was kind of a genius about that stuff okay you can go to his school in Paris. It's still there. That's what you should do. Take a year off and go to the Lecoq School in Paris. Wow. I would love to. And write about it and then come back. Actually, you know what? I I lied. I can't think of anything <laughs> more frightening <laughs> than to go to a performance school. I mean, just to, just to sit, just oh. to stand in front of a crowd uh, and then oh. emulate sex anal sex oh. and then on top of that you stood there yeah. and you did you had a whole monologue where you were in your underwear yeah i stood there in some um tidy whities and talked about um 
you know, I, I did this monologue at that moment in the in that performance. It was one of my thesis. That was part of my thesis. It was that piece, and I was kind of making fun of how what I feel like in culture. People are like, what 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 kind of pants define your personal style? Like, how are you defined by the things you buy and own? And I was like, that's so revolting. Right. You know, I hate that so bad. And it never goes away. It never goes away. It's it's a thousand fold worse than when I made that piece that you saw, because there was no social media then. Mm. And social media is that to the nine millionth degree. You yeah. Know? Totally. How is my dinner to find who I am? Mm-hmm. My lifestyle is like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like so ripe to be made fun of. But at a certain point you can't even make fun of people anymore because they're so rabidly making fun of themselves all the time as as legit culture. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's almost no place. Right. 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 I don't know. That's pretty weird. I I just saw that performance as as <laughs> and as an outsider, I was thinking this man has no fear. Oh my god. Or maybe so what what is the fear that would make you do that? No, what is yeah, that would make you do that or what is the dialogue that goes on in your mind while you're conceptualizing this thing and then the commitment that you're saying to yourself, I'm going to perform this in front of a crowd and I don't care anymore. You know that I don't give a fuck moment. <laughs> there were people that did things in my performance art program that I won't even tell you that were so much more ballsy than that. Okay. Um but for like a, a person just to be in that situation, I mean, really the work that you're talking about should be that vulnerable. Yeah. You know, it's just part of it uh-huh. that you're like that. Like I was like a child in that piece kind of who became the, like this dark hillbilly king of America you know did you see that part where I turn into the king of America and yeah. he's like got a crown and he's riding a rocking horse and his tidy whities and he's like and and that was pre-Trump that I made that and I made that because I grew up in the Midwest and I know what that mentality is like and I could tell that that person was coming that being was coming and that they would just absolutely be psychophants for that kind of cr- person and then then the reality became so much more that I can't even make fun of it that way Shit. like having actual Trump he's like a mockery of himself you know like right. to such a degree that it's it, it's like making them bulletproof mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. it's really weird mm-hmm. I spent a bunch of time I was hired by the Chinese government to go to China for 10 weeks and go to every province in China and train people in clown at all of the Chinese acrobat schools and so all the performers in China are called acrobats even though they're not really all doing acrobatics but it's in that circus realm and I went to teach them clown and some of the first exercises I did was like this guy had this deal where he would um, you throw the plates and he would catch all the plates so he has these gloves where he can catch these big metal plates and his thing is I'll catch every plate like that's how good I am and they want to learn clown but they want to bring their act and, and tell you how to make it I want you to tell them how to make it funny and have je in the act because it's okay. boring yeah right so the guy's like got his plates and Joe Diefenbacher and I are like throwing the plates for him but we're just leading him a little further every plate that we throw until he just eats shit into all these chairs and falls down and he doesn't catch the plates and it's just terrible but everybody's dying laughing the whole time <laughs> Every time we throw a worse one for him to try to catch it, he's desperate to try to catch it. And then he, then he, and it was so funny. And at, and then he came up and he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I couldn't catch all the plates. And we're like, you're missing the point. Like, yeah, yeah, did yeah. Did you hear the audience? And he's like, uh, kind of. And we're like, see, so you're caught up in like trying to be good at what right. you're doing. You have to like let, you have to see the big picture of like how this is so funny for us. The and folly. So, yeah, he folly. has no concept of folly. Yeah. Like it's right there, ready to like lurk in on you, swoop in on you as soon as you. And there were a lot of people like that. We had exercises where you had to like pretend to be your dad and then pretend <laughs> to be the opposite of your dad <laughs> and pretend oh, to be your mom, shit. pretend to be the opposite of your mom. 
and that would blow them away and i thought wow and the the chinese government filmed every single class that i taught in china over the course of 10 weeks and i thought oh my god they don't even know like this is putting subversive ideas into their culture like this is their undoing right now wow if yeah. these people leave here and go make clown work and they're like subverting authority like you know it's the perfect place for a clown to exist a place where there's a lot of authority yeah that's what i what i first saw was researching the history of clowns and the fact that and you mentioned this earlier that ceos don't have uh a jester no. or a clown you know but the fact that or a sense of humor the clown could yeah. enter a king's court yeah and make personal insults yeah, to, to the, the king. king he paid for it paid for yeah, it but if it was too good he'd cut off your head yeah, yeah. but i was like whoa what uh what isn't that funny what a role in 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 society right i mean you need that yeah but i mean there's that thing they might not like it yeah the king might cut off your head right you know, will smith might slap you yeah yeah what was your then reaction you know, then you know you're really doing your job you know? If somebody slaps you? Well, I mean, you really know you're doing your job. You got their goat that bad. Uh, you know, that guy could just be had his own personal experience with the other person or whatever, or feel really weird about his relationship with his wife. And if somebody made fun of her, then put it. It's you're gonna always kill the comic. You know, mm. you're mad about this other thing. You're mad about a bunch of things. Is it really the comic? No. Wow. You're not controlling yourself. You're taking it out on the messenger. That person's just bringing you the message or. You know, it's a weird thing for that to have happened. I think that, I mean, people do, everybody does some dumb thing at some point, mm -hmm. and that's folly, you know? Yeah. There's also that forgiveness. There is no good person and no bad person. There's a good guy that does bad stuff sometimes and a bad guy that does good stuff. There's a lot of murderers on death row that probably made somebody a birthday cake once. Yeah. You know? Yeah. My daughter and I talk about it all the time in the context of good and bad. We're like, she's nine. You know, when she was little, I'd be Darth Vader and I'd be like, turn to the dark side. And she's like, it's not a side. You just flick a switch and turn on the light, dummy. And I'm like, right, exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 And now, now she loves villains in movies because okay. she sees the, the story of the villain. Like mm -hmm. she really likes Darth Vader and she really likes, um, what's her name in Harry Potter, the witch that's, uh, Oh, I can't think I of I don't her know name. Harry Potter. Yeah. Oh, there's the witch that she, uh, Bellatrix Lehane. Okay. She really likes yeah. the villains. She likes them. And recently, in, in recent years, you know, watching The Dark Knight, I, oh, and people yeah. love the Joker and what he represents or what. Yeah. Gosh, did you watch yeah. the Joker movie? I did. I was at the theater and people were cringing and gasping and I was laughing so hard. <laughs> and I was standing up clapping when all of the Jokers set everybody free to just do mayhem. Yeah. But, I mean, I like chaos in some ways. Mm. I was like, ooh, you guys did it. Okay. You did it to yourself. Now I'm seeing uh, that. I'm seeing know? parallels. Right. With, like, the cl oh. with clowns and with the Joker. Right. Chaos. That was uh, a weird thing. I was thinking about Batman. You know, Batman is a symbol of hypervigilance. Batman's mm -hmm. a trauma victim. Trauma Batman victim. Batman experienced mm -hmm. trauma as a child. His parents were shot in front of him. And after mm -hmm. that, he became hypervigilant. Hypervigilant, yeah. And I used to be really enamored with Batman when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I was really into Batman because I think... I think I'm hypervigilant in some ways. Mm. I was like, oh, Batman. But then I watched this thing about the Joker and I was like... <laughs> Yeah. He's so good. That's a great, a great performance. And there were all these nods to this other film called The King of Comedy mm -hmm. that they were nodding to. And that's why De Niro's in there because yeah. De Niro's in The King of Comedy, if you've ever seen that film. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, always that dark side of comedy, you know? Right. Or the sad clown or the dis disgruntled. You know who made the first scary clown? No. 
you would think you, you won't believe it everyone's like oh scary clowns why are there there's a lot of clowns that are like why are there scary clowns the clowns are trying to do good i'm like no they're not they're emissaries of chaos they're tricksters in every culture you're not supposed to not be afraid of them you should be afraid of them do you want them to come like rearrange your kitchen do you want them in your house like do you want them to be your driver you want clowns for your driver they're supposed to be syrix, like satirical fuck ups they're, yeah. they're not supposed to be good things mm. so mm -hmm. you should be afraid of them but the person who created the first scary clown story um, that was published is Charles Dickens Charles Dickens Dickens wrote a story uh -huh. about scary clowns no shit yeah he used to write um, like the little periodical stories mm -hmm. and one of his was about a clown who was a killer wow wow so blame it on Charles Dickens but it was he had no genius. pictures he had no pictures of clowns in that no, they were though they were probably there? clowns for oh, okay. sure. Yeah, yeah. the The earliest I could think of was Stephen King's It. Gosh, yeah, and yeah. Even, even in Comedia, you know, there were white faced clowns, and you know, Harlequin was a white faced clown, a patchwork. Mm. Um, was an early kind of clown archetype. Even before that, even way, way back, you know, at the very, very beginning, there was like a fire and there was a guy that would stand at the fire and be like the shaman and like tell you like, this is what you should do. And then pretty soon that was the person became a holy person. And as soon as they became a holy person and they're like, I'm so fancy, Shit. the clown emerged and was like, yeah, you're nothing, you're, yeah, nothing. Yeah, you're yeah, dirty, yeah, yeah. just like us. <laughs> and then... Then <laughs> there became this dichotomy. And in Berkeley, years and years ago, maybe somebody that listened to this would remember this. I've never seen this, but I heard about it. There was a guy who had had a block and he would stand on it and preach. Mm -hmm. And he would, he was like, preach love. And he was like, like kind of a, a Christian preacher or something. And he would preach. And then this other guy who was like dirty, lived under a bush and wore a dress. He would like, had this like, he was like wearing a dress but he's like a bearded dude he'd like stand on this other podium and this guy would be like god loves you and this guy would be like god hate your fucking guts you know <laughs> on the other side. and, and yeah. at first the christian guy was like god i wish this guy would go away but after a while they started to work as a team Interesting. you have to have both those things you can't have divinity without the folly you know you gotta have mm. the chaos mm. isn't that weird yeah and in a sense that's what you're trying to channel in your performances is that yeah. is there a moment of letting go of what people give a fuck about in yeah. regards to your performance well, I mean you want to show like chaos you want to show folly you want to have moments of of divinity moments of glory we also call them moments of glory like a good yeah. example is like look at the Marx Brothers I don't know if you ever watched that but the Marx Brothers, Harpo Marx is an amazing musician. Actually, I think all of them were amazing musicians, mm -hmm. but he'll be doing something silly and he's like a ridiculous person and then all of a sudden he picks up a harp and he can play these beautiful songs or he plays the piano and he plays these amazing things. Like, the clown should have a moment of glory. Ah. Uh, you know? I'm uh, trying, for my Gastro Absurdo show, I'm trying, it wasn't in the footage you saw, but I bought three of these giant whisks, like half the size of a man. <laughs> whisks. And I'm trying to juggle them. Yeah. So I'm still working on that. Mm. Mostly my hands can't stand the bludgeoning of catching them. Oh, oh When I flip oh, one over oh. and it hits my hand, it's like, <laughs> kapow! I'm like, oh, can uh, I juggle these? And I handed them to, to some actual jugglers, and they were like, you might have to change the weight yeah. balance, you know? Yeah. But you need moments of glory mm. where the fool is exalted, mm -hmm, you know? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you want to be exalted. Everybody's an idiot. Yeah. You want to see moments where you're like, I'm dumb, just like the clown. And then yeah. the clown does something cool. So those are the moments where you feel like you've kind of detached from the crowd and you're kind of living in that those moments of hey you know what i'm doing what i'm doing without any regards for what what outcome that you were expecting oh, you're never really detached from them oh, if they're watching you okay you only you only get that freedom when you go backstage and it's so nice it's so different yeah you can even set up a stage and like you and I can walk around it and the other one of us stand on the other side and when you're seen yeah and then when you walk behind it there's like this different mm. feeling so is there a zone like do you do you have a zone you know how athletes feel like 
there. Oh, yeah, uh, when it's going well and you're really in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, you can be, like, um, in a flow state. Okay. In the middle of doing something where it's going really well. I think in that footage that you saw, I improvised that whole ending where I, you know, spoiler alert, I, like, throw a million, like, balls into the audience yeah, that's so and awesome. they're throwing them back and I'm trying to hit them with a pan but I can't because there's too many of them and I'm fat and slow I just can't and it doesn't work out but that's kind of a state like that or like I made those long noodles and then a noodle went out there yeah. and then a piece of the noodle came off when you're like when you're really playing with something that was unexpected but you're rolling with it that's literally a flow state oh, right because cool. you're improvising yeah wow I do that, I mean, for myself, when I'm not performing or creating work or teaching, I paint. Mm. And I paint a lot of paintings during the pandemic when I was trapped indoors. Everyone's like, you have to be trapped inside for a year. I was like, I get to be a painter for a whole year. Nobody wants me to do anything. In fact, they want me to do nothing. Mm. So I'm going to paint. And I painted like 180 paintings. Whoa. And I sold about 10 grand's worth of them so far. (gasps) And I have a show coming up. I put some paintings at this punk rock bar in the mission called Benders. And um, my paintings are up through the end of the month. So if you go to Benders, there's some big, weird paintings on the wall. Wow. I made those during the pandemic. <laughs> right on. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hell yeah. So I'm going to do my show eventually. I'll do the Gastro Absurdo show here before I take it on tour. Because things are opening up now. Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. go back out, take stuff on the road. I made a, a touring show, like a walk around act for a European festival. It's called Donut Goat. It's like a clown punk rock band. I saw that. Yeah. Um, there's a yeah. bunch of versions of that. The early, <laughs> early stuff is on there, and then it got better, yeah. but um, which is like a two man walk around act. Yeah, yeah. That I want to take to festivals. So when you think of all these performances, are you jotting, jotting them down on a notebook or. Are you just making yeah, things up on the fly? Some What's of them the are on video now, like in a modern day. Mm-hmm. I want to make a show that Church of Clown helps fundraise for that is myself and a couple of other mentors that I've had, Stephen Chips and Pamela Chermansky. And they're, we're all students of Marceau Marceau. We mm-hmm. all met at the Mime School a million years ago. I'm 52. They're older than me. But they're so funny. Like, they're way funnier than me. I'm, like, not even funny on the scale of how they're funny. Like, I'm not even anything. I should just be in the audience of their show. But I want them to make a show with me. And I'm trying to talk them into it. So maybe if, they're, if they listen to this... Please, please make a show with me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that would be good. Interesting. Yeah. What, um, when you think of the people that you want to work with or the people that you've studied under, and you talked about the, for every, you know, the sad clown, the happy clown, the funny clown, there's a sad clown, there's a dark side. Um, Do you feel that that's the, do you feel like that's what makes great, clowns or great performers well, I know that adversity that uh-huh. creates comedy mm. things are born from adversity mm-hmm. you know and even in the structure of a play something has to happen mm-hmm. something happens that you have to overcome you know there is a problem there has to be a, I mean laughter there's this really weird book called laughter the essay on the meaning of the comic it was written by Henri Bergson in like I think like 1914 like Mm -hmm. and the thing that I got from this whole treatise this guy wrote is that laughter is essentially corrective in nature corrective Uh, corrective like you do something that I laugh at because that is not what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> yeah. And so I laugh and laughter is like if you and I are both running up the stairs and you fall down running up the stairs, I'm going to be like, whoa, oh my God, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to laugh kind yeah. of. Like yeah. it's a, a automatic reaction that we have to when something isn't um, the way it's supposed to be. And comedians just point out how society creates those moments. They point out things that aren't supposed to be, and we laugh at them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know? And there's, like, an element also of, like, death. There's an element of death in things that are funny. Like, you're not going to be... The, it's the same as beauty. It's not forever. 
It's temporary. I it's right that. now. That's why it's important. You know? Uh-huh. That's why teaching the humanities or having people explore those things show the fragility of the human person and the vulnerability of the human person and the softness and the you know, human being superpower. Another thing I learned from reading that book is that our superpower is the ability to collaborate with other human beings. Right. And that's why powers that want to control you don't want you to collaborate with anyone. Mm-hmm. They want you to just be alone. Because your superpower, your real power as a human being is to, is to work with other people. Mm-hmm. To collaborate. That's how humans got awesome. Yeah. That's how we survived to now. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's held up by their dead ancestors all the time. You're literally puppeted around by ghosts yeah. uh, every day. Not, I mean, literally in your DNA, you're yep. doing things that your ancestors did, reenacting traumas that they did and all these things. Yeah. You're literally puppeted by a bunch of ghosts, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> questions are you asking yourself when you're conceptualizing a experimental performance like I try to find something that I want to talk about and then I try to find a physical metaphor for that thing Like when I was little, my mom used to always say, actions speak louder than words. And I really listened to that idea because I was like, I thought that was true. Yeah. You know? Are you trying to solve, so you're trying to solve like something internally, internal questions that you're asking in physical form? Like try to show a thing. Mm-hmm. Or I might something might bug me like climate change. Mm-hmm. Like one, okay, here's a piece I wrote, but I didn't have the guts to perform. Okay, this is my climate change piece. Okay, I didn't have the guts to perform this, but I wrote a piece for climate change. Okay, where you, the audience comes in, and I have a goldfish on stage in a bowl. <laughs> And they see the goldfish and they see me. And then I start asking people how they got there. How'd you get to the show? And if they're like, I drove. I put three drops of oil into the goldfish bowl. Okay. They're like, oh, I rode my bike. I put one drop. Okay. They're like, what what did you eat last night for dinner until I put enough oil in the goldfish bowl that the goldfish dies? But instead of that, because I thought that's too hardcore, I don't want to kill a fish in front of people that even even though it's a fish maybe we could eat a fish like who cares the act of ritually killing an animal in front of the audience would be too intense for them wow. but it would really drive home the point you're literally killing the planet with all the choices that you make or or not killing the planet mm-hmm. so i what i ended up doing was using it in my piece that i eventually performed where they would say something and I would drink some of the fish's water and then they'd say something and I'd drink more of the water (laughs) and and I actually got sick you can't drink fish water the goldfish's water even if it's not even if it's pretty new it's not good for you but I drank a bunch of the goldfish's water (laughs) and it was it was ill from that one time I fought a coke machine like I fought a coke machine in a boxing match and it fractured one of my hands I was fighting a I got an old timey coke machine restored it to like perfect and then did a performance piece where I boxed a coke machine it was like fighting a robot yeah <laughs> wow wow it sounds very fil- sounds like what you're doing is very philosophical sometimes yeah. I mean there's usually a point Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the gastro absurdo show is the one that has the the least. It's not trying to like. It's not trying to send a hard satire to like talk to you. You know, it's, right. it, I want you to identify with the guy. He just wants to be a chef. He just. I think I'm softening into a realm where 
my work can be more accessible to people. Right. It won't be so like in your face. Sure. Yeah, you know, that's, I'm not that's cool. Poop on the American flag or something. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but the, what I did feel though <laughs> when I watched that performance was the rat in the frying pan kind of made right. me gag a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. so fun. It's so fun to have a rat in a frying pan. Yeah. Since your performances are so, you know, where the audience comes in without any expectations. Um, how do you evaluate? Let's say you're one of the audience. How do you evaluate like a good experimental piece, performance piece? Um, is wow. there an evaluation? I don't know. I mean, I think if you're at a performance and you don't like it, you should get up and leave always. Ooh. And I do it in the theater all the time. Mm -hmm. I just took my daughter to go see... Someone gave us tickets to Jesus Christ Superstar. The show came through town. Yeah. She made it 10 minutes. She was like, ugh. And I was like, what's your review? And she's like, it's, it's the same. They build it up, then they do a song, and then they come back down, and then they build it up, and they do a song, and all the songs sound the same. And I was mm -hmm. like, it's true. I don't mm -hmm. like it either. We bailed from that. It was good. Um, I always just get up and leave a theater show if you don't like it. You should always leave. Mm -hmm. Don't stay there. You're not supposed to. And don't clap if you don't like it. Right. Audiences clap. Mm -hmm. Don't clap. You don't like it. Don't clap. You don't have to clap. Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you know? The person who's performing it doesn't need you to protect their feelings. Yeah. They wouldn't be there if they were that fragile. Right, know? right. They, they're they going to be okay. I mean, I've, I can remember, because I used to do like all these rap performances when I was a teenager and in my 20s, and mm. I remember just being so contrary to whatever the popular music was at the time. Mm. You know, people love to have fast music and have their heads nodding. And I remember <laughs> the, the beats that we chose for that performance were slow. <laughs> Uh, our lyrics were very like socially I don't know I, I could give a shit about the lyrics but what we felt at the time were like socially conscious and I remember some kids in the crowd were like throwing glow sticks in the air and it was just like oh my god I had this immediate feeling of they don't they don't like what we're doing right now <laughs> and it hurt it really hurt I remember being I remember being Wow, wind is going crazy here. Um, I remember being backstage and just being, just feeling so defeated. So yeah, when, when you when, when you say that the performer yeah. is not doesn't hold. I mean, yeah, probably not. But I could still. That was a very traumatizing event in. God, when I think my, about yeah. clowns, the part of the training is that you have to stand in the fire, you have to like be in the shit, and you have to you have to fail, and you you take the actual <sighs> failure to turn it into the fun of it. Yeah, that's a unique thing yeah. about clown. If you're like a musician and you're playing your song, and nobody likes it. You don't have any recourse. You can't. Or if I paint a painting and somebody doesn't like it, I can't do anything about that. Yeah, I can't. You know, it's futile. Mm -hmm. to try mm -hmm. to change it but it is kind of fascinating that clowns have a, a chance at redemption yeah right yeah there's a you could be redeemed in that moment while you're sucking so bad you could be redeemed and be glorious right through accepting your own foibles mm. can you, you give know? an example of of a time oh, that you God. felt like it was going bad. Oh, that happens a lot. I always feel like I think that about life. I think it's going bad, and then I'm like, "Whoa, a moment of glory!" And then it's bad again. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, God, there's a lot of things, a lot of moments like that where little tiny things happen, and you're like suddenly saved. Like here's one. We were doing our Caput show in Chicago at a theater downtown, mm -hmm. and. The city of Chicago had given us this theater to do X amount of performances in. So it was a free space, but it was beautiful. And we're doing our show, and uh, someone's cell phone went off in oh. the audience. 
And so I went into the audience and I'm like looking for who it was. And it was this lady and she was terrified and she took her phone and put it in her purse. I was clutching her purse and I took her purse because I had this big mallet. So I was just like threatening her with this Like hammer. a cartoon mallet? Yeah, like a big wooden mallet. And I just took her purse away because she didn't want me to bludgeon her with this mallet. And I also played the mean character of the villain. So she was like, you know, reluctantly she gave up her purse to me. And I took it up on stage and there was a side door that looks like it goes into the alley. And I opened the side door and I just threw her purse out and it looked like I just threw her purse into the street and closed the side door at the theater. <gasps> okay. And and that was a really fun moment. The audience loved it. And of course the ladies valuables were, were safe, you know. Yeah. In yeah. That moment. To just play with when you think something's interrupting a moment, you go with it. You know, it's really food that's like candy you're getting candy from the gods to like mm-hmm. play with mm-hmm. has that ever helped you in in in, in waking in like, life outside oh, of the I stage for sure for sure clown has taught me like i was saying before like to have kind of a faith that things are unfolding and if you're present with the process of things unfolding you can see the nuances where there could be something good for you but if you're dedicated to this one story you're not flexible anymore you're not changeable yeah so in a way you're you're you are looking for openings you are looking for something to grasp on that you Mm -hmm. can work with i think any moment that you start to feel sad or you're mad about something Uh really look at what role you're playing in that moment you're probably inflexible Inflexible. I know that for me, I'm not changeable. Uh huh. And as soon as a character on stage becomes un- unchangeable, the yeah. audience hates them. It's weird. If I go on stage mm-hmm. and you don't know what I'm going to do, and maybe I pick up this phone and it's hot, and I'm like, ow! Mm-hmm. But then I pick it up again, ow! And they're like, why did you pick it up? It's hot. He knows it's hot. And then I go to pick it up again and I don't. And now I go to pick up this other thing. The audience is still with me. Okay. With my train of thought. Yeah. But if I'm unchangeable, if I just want, ow, 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 mm. I'm not changeable. As soon as you're not changeable, if the audience boos you or is happy for you, when you're cease to be changeable, the audience stops projecting themselves into your character and they move on to someone else. Wow. Who can be exploring. Because they're exploring the world through you. Uh huh. So you have to stay. You have to stay changed. What's happening to you? What are you? What are you doing? And then they want to be you. You know. Yeah. And then it's you. The death of your story. The death of your story. Mm-hmm. You're no longer changeable. What uh-huh. are you doing? Oh. Uh, then what happens? Right. 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 And you mentioned curiosity to bring into a performance. Yeah. How do you? How do you bring curiosity into a performance, especially if it's something that's already set in your mind? I think it's in the process of making it, and then even in the moment. Mm -hmm. Even in the moment, like there's there's moments that you can. There's a a play that I do with Derek Gilday called The Young Matador, and I play the bull, but I also play the old man that's teaching him how to be a matador, and. One of the ways that I train him as the old man, I'm like a cafe owner, and he's basically hanging out in a cafe, and that's where the whole play happens. And one of the ways I train him is I tie things to little cords, and I swing them at him like a frying pan or a cleaver. Uh And in the show one night, I'm like doing this thing where I'm like whipping this cleaver around. Oh, shit. And like zipping it past his head, and like he's bald and stuff, so it's like really scary. It might hit him, you know, and it's a real cleaver. It's a sharp kitchen cleaver and I'm like zinging it around and um, there's a moment where I took it and I stuck it into the table and when I pulled on the cord the cord just floated off of it it just came untied okay and the audience realized all that whole time it could have come untied <gasps> one one oh. instant before yeah and yeah I yeah thought, god if I could just build that kind of stuff in so it would just constantly be like <laughs> blowing genius. their mind that he's that he's not dead by some weird means, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, we did that show like 
maybe eight or ten times. We did it a lot of times. It's a fun performance we and, devised together. And the cleaver never came undone. No, it never hurt him. It never hit him. No, time. that one time it just came undone. Wow. And there's like a bull in the show. It's like a big drum, like a musical drum, on a, on a dolly, like a push truck. And then when he passes the bull, instead of stabbing a thing in it, he hits the drum, you know? But then at the end, the horns of the bull it's on, are on fire. And I'm Whoa. just trying to run over him with this cart. Uh-huh. And he even took that show into Mexico once and let the people drive the cart. And he and he was the matador. Crazy. Um, we designed it like that. He was just going to go into Mexico by himself and take the young matador show. And uh-huh. you know, here's this gringo guy pretending to be a very over-the-top matador. I mean, his whole outfit and everything is like 50 million colors. He looks like Whoa. Disneyland threw up on him. And you're able to, yeah, you're able to do this. You've, you've been to China. You've been to... Yeah. I went a bunch of places. I went to 45... Well, now 48 states and probably 26 different countries. Mm -hmm. I used to do shows for the Department of Defense. Mm. They would send us around to do shows because we didn't need language. We could do a show with no talking so they could show it to anyone. But then after a while, we were like, "Eh, maybe we don't want to do shows for them because we're helping them make friends with where they want to have military bases. Yeah. We're like, eh, we don't want to work for you. Wow. Wow. There's this thing we do in clown that's called dad's mad where like I come in the room and I pretend like I'm dad. Yeah. And it's like dad's mad. So everybody has to be careful of everything they do. I'm going to be pissed off about it. (laughs) Dad's mad. It's like, why are we on this vacation? Yeah. Yeah. It's just funny. Creates yeah. tension. You know, you want to create tension and then pop it. Mm-hmm. Makes people crack up. Mm. Yeah, I like that. And the two-person thing, like a Burton Ernie situation. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> you know, um... Are you going to come to my next clown workshop and do it with the people? Ooh. You know... There's a lot of really here, here's um, my con- fun people there. I would love to. Yeah. You know, here's my confession right now. I'm going to confess to you. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you were at the last gathering for the teachers. Mm. Were you? Which gathering? The very last at teacher Blue get together. Not Blue Bottle. After that. I didn't go to Blue Bottle. Okay. There was one after that at the farm where you can bring your own coffee coffee mug, your yeah, own Yeah, I plate. came to the farm. I didn't go. No. I didn't go because, you know, you're asked to share things and you're asked to... I don't know. I just feel like I'm not, you know, maybe that's my tripping is that when, when somebody asks me to be something that I'm not like to ask and speak in a group setting and do like a dance or like sing a song. They, they weren't you know going to make saying? anybody do it. And nobody did. Anything. Yeah. They brought a person that did stuff. Yeah. And we did stuff with them a little bit, but not even mm-hmm. anything. But I've been in that group situation where I wasn't, I was an active participant, but just more kind of like going through the motions. And then I saw, saw myself from outside of myself and I was like god do I want to be around this person right now right. you know what I mean right. like it's like kind of like the version of just get up and leave like get up right. from that performance right. and leave or the extrovert introvert You're yes like, right. why did I put myself in this situation okay. where now I have to pony up right so here's the th- I, I do a lot of things that take me beyond my comfort zone I, I do martial arts I, I run I swim in the ocean but to be in front of a crowd public speaking that freaks me oh, out. that's a good one then you yeah, should come to I a know. clown workshop you're it totally so cool. right yeah you're totally and right and everybody would be so cool to you and you get to watch them witness what happens to you if you do go in front of them and how it can be funny yeah because then it's at least it's not tragic it's funny it's not awful Okay. It could be fun. Well, it could be funny for us and awful for you oh yeah 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 for sure <laughs> yeah, I've seen that I've had students come out and really I had to coach them to not leave and they just came out and they were so filled with emotion about being in front of the group that they would cry yeah but they would try to just stay there but as they're (sighs) crying we would laugh so hard in like kind of a sweet way because we're just like oh my god everyone is like having the emotion that they're having but we're just like oh my god it's okay it's okay 
you know, it's so it, funny. Because everybody so, goes through that, right? Oh, my God. Everybody goes through that? I mean, they might not cry. Right. But yeah, but there I is laughed. a... I laughed. I couldn't stop laughing. So the, the, uh, that leads me to think of this next question is, what is the difference between a day one person, like, let's just say I were to go in to your next clown workshop from a, like a Marcel, Marceau... Marcel Marceau? Yeah. What, what's the difference? What do you mean, like, if you just came into one versus somebody like... So let's say Marcel Marceau is a black belt. Oh, my God. And I'm a day one white belt. Whoa. What would be the difference in skills, mental... Some people some people can walk into a clown workshop, walk up on stage, and are totally present and able to play with their own foibles. They just can't. They're so, I want to say, socially adjusted in a certain way that, it, that it's cool for them. Oh, cool. Yeah. So then for them... It's about like finding the humor and finding the moments and then like accentuating the moments and like creating surprise and there's all this levels of stuff to do after you're actually comfortable in a Mm -hmm. performance environment. Not just a normal performance environment, but clown where you're actually present with the audience. Like I can go go over there and pretend like you're a tree and then a bunch of people watch you and they're like, neat tree. And you're like, I was so good. But if you're like the tree who has to show us what it's like to be afraid that the woodcutter's coming to cut you down but it's you john oh geez john the tree (laughs) you know it's like you're using part of yourself it's just different it's more vulnerable you know it's a really vulnerable art form it's like thought exercises too where you get to use your body to embody yeah whatever the prompt is. Yeah, there's a teacher um, here in San Francisco that um, is like a Zen clown teacher. And he mm. uses the exercises to be like Zen Cohen's, mm-hmm. you know, like there's yeah. a lot of ways to approach this kind of thing. You can come out just the physical comedy element, or you can make fun of yourself, or you can make fun of something else. Mm. You know? And you say you're still experiencing these kinds of feelings all the time all the time and is it through the lens of your per- your performance experience or is it you know it's still happening like all those things that I'm interested in in clown are part of my regular life to such a degree that I'm always thinking about it uh, like one time I quit doing any performance and I worked in an organic fruit market Mm-hmm. And then it wasn't like three days later that I was like passing apples really fast from one hand to another, <laughs> like stacking apples as fast as I can until they all fall. And then trying to like, you know, I'm, I'm just causing physical problems mm. to have to figure out or trying to carry too many things at the same time. Like you ever try to like have four things in your hands and like still try to get away with trying to open the door Yeah, and you can't. And when you look at yourself from the outside, you're like, this is really funny because I'm unwilling to relinquish some of these things like why why do I have to do that why can't I just set them down Mm, mm -hmm. like that's rational but no (laughs) no I gotta hold them I'm clutchy I'm greedy or something you know yeah it's funny it just reveals so much about human nature Mm. so what have you learned most about yourself or about other people oh man I'm ridiculous and everyone is ridiculous. You can't take yourself seriously. You're not, no one's really anything. No, you think that this guy that has this fancy job that you see on TV is some kind of thing? No, he's a moron, just like us, just like yeah. every other person. Everybody is a colossal idiot. Mm-hmm. To pretend that you're not is completely lies, filled with lies. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's just doing their best. They're just trying. Yeah. You know? There's a nice way to look at it sometimes. Like if you're driving and you're one of those people that are like, oh, this guy's an idiot driving in front of me. I like to just think, oh, he's just a little guy. What if he was little? You wouldn't be like, you know, the tod- they're just toddlers. Like grownups are just like drunken toddlers. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like, he's just a little guy trying to find his way back home. He's just a little guy. He had too much to drink. He fell down on the street. He's just a little guy. It's just a little guy robbing the bank. It's just a little guy trying to get some money out of the bank. You know? <laughs> it changes your perspective. Yeah. If you think of humans as just little, just little hmm. guys doing stuff. Hmm. Is there is there times where you're where you're letting, where you let the the humor down a little bit, 
and you're you you tell yourself, okay, it's time to be serious. What, what, what I are think those the moments? humor is the the result of me being dreadfully serious the rest of the time. I appreciate that. If you're really dreadfully serious, your release is humor. If you're having fun all day, why would you ever be a clown? Clowns are dreadfully serious people. They're they're real serious about how their humor happens. What is it? What is? Some people are like, that's not clown. This is clown, and this. They argue on the line all the time. It's ridiculous. Mm. Even Fellini. Fellini has a movie called Clowns. Mm-hmm. And the best scene in the movie is three different kinds of clowns all sitting at a table arguing about who's the best clown. <laughs> they're all white faced clowns. They're all um. They're all vice clowns, like top top clowns in the echelon of clowns there's like a boss clown and then two dumb ones and they're the top ones but they're all arguing over who's the best top one it's really (laughs) funny um i mean most everybody in the world is dreadfully shit serious you know yeah yeah they have to like i could get some bad news right now i could get like a phone call and then i would be ah just so serious Mm. And then suddenly it goes away and then you're like, oh, why was I so serious about that? Like, who cares? You're only going to live less than 100 years anyway. Right. So how are you going to learn anything? How's your, how's all of humanity going to learn much when you only live that long? If you live to be 300, there wouldn't be a lot of problems that we have now because you wouldn't be able to be like, oops, oh, I died. Yeah. Let's, let's start learning all over again. Right. Most of the people, <clears throat> the ideas that we have in our Every anywhere, three hundred years, yeah. it probably will be replaced by something else. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it won't even look like this. It's not that long ago. I mean, it's forty thousand years ago. Someone invented a spear. Forty thousand. That's not a long time ago. No. But then you look at the Grand Canyon, and it's just like nine hundred eighty what million billion years ago. <sighs> I don't even know. Uh, it's just, you I know. I suck at math. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. Also baking. I suck uh, at baking because you have to measure. <laughs> I don't like to measure. Or my daughter's teaching me to crochet, and every time I make a mistake, I want to undo the whole thing. Ah, She's like, you can't. you got to roll with it. Right. you got to let the mistake be in there. She said that to you? Yes. She told me the best joke I ever heard. You want to know the best joke I ever heard my whole life? My daughter I told do. me this joke when she was three. I was laying in bed with her in the dark. I just finished reading her story. I turned off the light. We're both just laying there in the dark in that nice, sweet little moment. And she goes, Daddy, do you believe in God? And I was like, well, I don't know, Gene. That's really, you know, complicated question. And as I'm trying to form my answer, I feel her little tiny hand come over underneath my face and she opens her hand and releases a fart into my face. (laughs) And that was the punchline to her setup. Daddy, do you believe in God? And then she just opened a little a little rosebud of a hand right under my face with a fart in it. I don't know how she knew how to fart into her own hand. Oh, but that's yeah. that's the best joke I was ever told. Oh, I thought wow. that was pretty goddamn funny. <laughs> because I mean she's three years old, how does she know that? How does yeah. she know to juxtapose those two things? Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't know. That yeah. really is a brilliant joke. It's most probably instinct, childlike right? instinct. And that, and in that moment, that serene, beautiful moment, everything was the perfect setup for that joke. <laughs> Best joke I ever heard. It's on the list, though. I heard so many good things. I yeah. really want to go see it. It's like a multiverse thing happening. Right. You believe in that? Multiverse? The multiverse? Yeah. Yeah. I think that in every conceivable way that what is happening right now is really happening. Yeah. Like, I have horns, and you're a yeah. robot, yeah. and another one, I'm marshmallow, yeah. and you're made out of seaweed. We're drinking that. goldfish water. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Every possible Every permission. Possible. There's no way it couldn't be true. Yeah. That has to be true. Yeah. Somehow. 
Yeah, I've been reading a lot about that lately. It's, it's, crazy. Fa- it's fascinating. And uh, yeah, have you heard of the book called The Beginning of Infinity? No. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the beginning and end of knowledge. There really is no end of knowledge. And it's a lot of weird stuff that I'm, you know, I don't have a very big logic brain muscle. A lot of it is very, <laughs> like, abstract, uh, or, you know trying to make sense out of things that aren't supposed to be made sense out of that's how i've always kind of worked (laughs) that's the real intelligence yeah you know but you know i've been trying to work the logical side of my brain a little bit more and yeah that that's been one of them is multiverse yeah thank you thank you thank you you're welcome Thanks for sharing your world. I'm really Man, fascinated I'm, with it. You're the only person at school that even knows me. Really? Yeah, because you looked up what I actually do. No, no, no one knows. No one. Yeah. No. no one who knows. has time? They this know. question is in my mind. How does a clown raise a child? But also, you. You decided to put your yeah the the school that you decided. You have very strong Man. ideas about preschool and. Yeah, we, my wife and I, when we decided to have a child, we had a child here in the Bay. We wanted to raise our child in the Bay and we sent her to preschool out in the sunset at a school where um, my wife at the time, Danielle, used to teach at that preschool and it's like a really progressive kind of preschool and then when your kid gets older and it's time to like go to school school you go to this like conference like in a big gymnasium and all the schools and SF are there and as you walk around the room they want you to bring their kid your kid to their school so they're really rabid they're like in the first year we could teach your kid Latin and we could teach you Spanish and like whatever and then um I walked around the room and when I got to this one table, it was just Jesse Elliott and like, um, Lauren. And they were like, Hey, what are you doing? And I was like, after just going around the room and like, everyone's trying to murder me to make me bring my kid to the school. I was like, what are you guys doing? I was like, are you guys Golden Bridges School? And they're like, yeah. And my students, my clown students had told me, because I said, I don't think I'm going to send my kid to school. I'm going to teach them myself and do a no school thing. Because some of the best theater students I've ever gotten came from families that raised their own kids. And they had told me to check out Golden Bridges School, because that's a, a progressive school. And so when I asked them, I was like, wow, you're this, uh, the vibe is obviously right. I was like, what are you guys, are you from Golden Bridge School? And they're like, yeah, how did you know? They didn't even have a sign at their booth. <laughs> they're just two people like, like this chill at their booth. Hey. Wow. I was like, what are you guys doing? They're like, meh. Mm-hmm. This no. was before your daughter was in preschool? No, she had already gone to preschool. It's so when oh, she was right. going to kindergarten. And so we picked... Golden Bridges School and then learned more and more about Waldorf School and then I started working for the school as a handyman because I walked into the school one day my daughter was already at the school and the school was like falling apart and Jesse Elliott was like are you here to be my handyman one day when I walked through the door and I was like yes and so I just started being the handyman just for fun while I was teaching clown at night I've seen so many instances during the times that I've worked for this school where another child asks another child, hey, are you okay? Yeah. Like, I'm sorry I ran into you. Like, are you good? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. Like, what? (laughs) You know, I know know a lot of (laughs) grownups that don't even do that. Uh They're just so aloof. Yeah. People are, I don't know. I know everybody's on their own trip. Yeah. And that's what I've kind of let myself give space to other people rather than trying to be like, hey, you should be more this, man. You need to be like mm-hmm. this, man. Mm-hmm. It's just. The school nah. has really cool norms. Huh? 
the schoolhouse really yeah cool what's norms. the norms what's the norms i don't really hear it too much but I they don't are know cool. them all I'm, i might miss a few but the one i'm really into right now you go through different ones that you like okay as you go to school and you're like with colleagues that are taking care of the inner and outer lives of little kids you know yes one is hold everyone in their highest light yeah I was, including yourself including yourself which is the thing you always forget people would always forget you know like everyone's pretty critical of themselves or like kind of down on themselves typically not everyone some people are like I'm awesome yeah but hold everyone in their highest light expect and expect and accept non-closure non-closure what does that mean? It might not wrap all up. It might not be solved. This might not be solved. We have this conversation. We don't know. We didn't learn anything. We just thought about it. Wow. There might be non-closure to, to events that happen between two people, like interpersonal things. John punched me in the arm when I was trying to make a sandwich. Now I'm mad. Eh? Maybe nothing happens. Maybe, Maybe you no. get exactly nothing about wow. that. Maybe you just sit with that for a couple of whiles. Yeah. Things might not go down. Like the attachment to outcomes. Yeah. Is kind of what we were talking about earlier with stories. I mean, it's yeah. it's all in the stories. You got to have an ending. Right. <laughs> like right. what happens? Oh my god. Yeah, we only have one story model now. They're yeah. all wrapped up. The characters can't die. People freaked out on television when they killed off characters of TV shows. People quit watching. They quit. They quit when that happens. They're like, I can't deal with the fact that you killed the character. I do too. But what a concept, though, is you take that away from society. What would society look like if there was no winner and no loser? That you just accept everything for, I mean, in nature. There doesn't have to be a winner. No. No. We're not competing for resources. There's more than enough resources and machine power to feed everybody and clothe everybody to a degree where they could only study what they're interested in. And then culture would happen and then evolution of humans would happen. We would wake up in a way that we can't right now. Yeah. Just go to Europe when you're here all the time. Walk around France. People aren't tripping. Because right. a waiter's in a union. He's taken care of. The guy sweeping the street's taken care of. They're not murdering each other for the last morsel of oh anything gosh. like in America. Yeah. They're so deranged and afraid in America always that they're going to lose something. Hmm. They have no idea of an abundant mindset. They're not thinking about abundance. They're thinking scarcity mindset wow. all the time. Why help your friend if you're, everyone's going to die? you got to keep everything for yourself. And that's the stories that we tell ourselves. Zombie apocalypse. Yeah. Any kind of apocalyptic story. Wow. Wow. It's also big for cults. I want to control a mass of people. What do I tell them? The world's ending. Why would I tell them anything else? If I want them to do what I want. So what 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 is the uh, what's the intention of the clown church? To really bring people together in community, teach people resilience, teach people service and humility by helping each other. One of our things that we do is called cosmophilia, and we just go out in nature. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And we adorn ourselves with things from wherever we are in nature. We like blend in and like Ooh. have this moment with nature where yeah. like we kind of, I don't want to say in a tribal way, but like in a, like in a way that you would if you didn't have anything. All we take is a string. Yeah. And then we find things and we adorn each other and celebrate each other while we're celebrating nature and we adorn someone and then photograph them. Uh, the School of Physical Theater uh-huh. uh, the is the work school? of the creative actor through command through command of space, gesture, dynamics, and an articulate body. The actor gives expression to passions, character, relationships, and world. Is Worlds. That from the Del Arte website? Yeah. Yeah, training. you should go there. You can take a summer program. Training is founded on 
observation and identification with nature, physical investigation of the body and its poetry, and an imaginative inquiry into the forms of culture and theater. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But I mean, and I already studied mine before I went there. I was already old when I went there. I was really? like 38. They were wow. like, I was one of the oldest students. You were an elder statesman. The students were like, the teachers were kind of like trying to boss us around, but mm. I was old. I was like, mm-hmm. seriously. Mm-hmm. And then one of the clown teachers, I fought him a lot. And then when they got rid of him, they let me have his job, and I got to be him for a year, and I was like, yeah, yeah, in your face. What, what was the intention? Going into there then If you already knew All that Why stuff Why did I go? Yeah I wanted to go to Graduate school For the stuff That I studied Which there isn't Anywhere to go To graduate school For that kind of stuff So I could teach At university And then I Got my degree From Del Arte And then I did Teach at university I taught at Academy of Art And I had already Taught at a bunch Of different universities But not like Full time But like If I left the Waldorf school I would just teach At a university Mm-hmm because I have way more than enough experience to get a university teaching job in my field. But then I'd have to move. But I don't want to move because I have a child. So I teach here instead. Because when I broke up with Danielle, when we broke up, I would definitely not stay here. Except I have a kid here. Yeah. Otherwise, I mean, I'd just go anywhere. I'd go Travel the world. to Europe and mm-hmm. teach. Mm-hmm. Where there's a lot of people that do physical theater stuff America's an art void like we have no art they have so much more art in every other country yeah. like so much it's so much a part of the fabric of society America just doesn't have it mm-hmm. closest they ever got was like the 70s hmm. you know, hmm. there was like dance companies and then the Maplethorpe exhibit happened and then the the government congress like voted to like cut cut the nea grants and then there were no more nea grants you used to be able to get an nea grant to be a mime what's an nea grant a national endowment for the arts grant oh. that would pay you, pay you john to, learn. to stay home study mime and be a mime my teachers were mimes on with the nea grants yeah they stayed home they produced two or three shows a year and they had enough money to do that. Now it's all privately funded. If you want to do anything, you have to fundraise your own shit. I mean, teachers have to fundraise to stay alive to be teachers. Like, the rich, the money doesn't go into culture anymore. It's just stolen or kept, you know? Hmm. And everybody's all like, we need to study more stuff about race and do more classes on race. I'm like, it's class that you need to be thinking about, which I always say, even when I was in grad school, I'm like, first thing you do when you're crushing everyone with you're the rich people is make them fight about race make them fight about opportunities like especially race though you race bait them so that they don't ever go class hey wait class all right and in america they don't no one thinks about class but it's really the rich that are crushing everybody's guts Mm. and people idolize them instead and the culture tells you to idolize them. Everything you see on television is like how fancy, how rich they are. All the rap videos, all the everything. It's just idolizing wealth and abundance. Yeah. But it, there's no community. There's no sharing. You know, it's really dumb. I can't believe. And then people just want to harp on race about everything. You need to get more racially everything. Yeah. No, you need to like really focus on class because the guy who's screwing you is the rich guy who's making everybody fight for these resources mm. and race baiting everybody so that they're like they're trying to take your jobs. Mm-hmm. I wish there were like classes. I, I mean, our school makes you go study things about race all the time. We have to take workshops and have anti racist curriculum and like all kinds of stuff and I'm like when are we going to do actual things I don't want to talk about it forever I want to go work at a soup kitchen I want to go somewhere where poor people are and help those people all the hours that you make sit here and read this book and talk to other people that think just like me don't do jack that's performative nothingness but they get pissed when I say that because I'm the only person that's going to say that because I grew up in this I'm like no I went to grad school here everyone's like boo yeah I'm like, let's go. I was like, do you know anybody in the neighborhood that runs a business? Have you been to those businesses? Have you been to the businesses, the Chinese-owned businesses on San Bruno Avenue? Probably not. Been to the coffee shop? It's a black-owned business. Come on, teachers. What do you guys do? 
Yeah. Why are we having this conversation? Like, wow. Wow. I make enemies that way. Shouldn't be that way, though. You shouldn't make enemies that way. It should be an actual, like, oh, point taken. Or you know? Like, or like, Something like or that. Like, yeah, maybe we'll try that. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. Exactly. Uh, it's still unfortunate. The, it's still the right and wrong, winner, loser kind of if mentality. If you don't keep a dialogue open, you can't even talk about stuff like race. Like, Black Lives Matter movement is, I consider, a successful movement because they still keep the dialogue open. They'll talk to anybody. You can be a total racist and have a conversation with them, and they're not going to end their conversation with you. The Me Too movement, you're not even allowed to have a conversation. You can't have a conversation. As soon as you say anything, they're like, you had enough, and the thing ends. And, And people, academics and stuff, have stepped back from that movement, and they're like... You guys are killing your own movement. You're not creating a conversation yeah. between groups. Yeah. You gotta have the human glue. Mm. Gotta not take it that seriously, but also take it seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not being intolerant. Hmm. Hmm. Well, we'll see what happens. Yeah. yeah. Why don't we go work the homeless prenatal program? Why don't we go work with homeless pregnant women of color who are yeah. former drug addicts why don't we do that as teachers one one evening a month instead of sitting here reading this book someone else wrote that we don't care about and we're just going to sit here and then you guys are going to start talking about school stuff in the middle of the thing and I'm just going to sit here and wish I was dead which happens to me here's, here's what I think is pretty valuable is how can you bring how can you bring that sense of you don't have to take all this shit too seriously to people? For the people that want that in their lives. Write a show about that. Right? How do you do that? Write a show about treating things lightly. Uh huh. My teachers used to say when we're doing uh, physical activities, or exercises and when you try fucking shit serious hard to like make something right they would be like be easy be they come touch me they'd be like be be easy with yourself be easy with yourself huh. i'd be like fuck ah, trying to do a thing they're like be easy be easy with yourself mm. be easy with yourself you can't stand in that place where you can see everything unless you're easy with yourself be easy with yourself i'd be like i don't know what that means beep 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 you know yeah but that's what it would be, like a show about be learning to be easy with yourself, which is easy to do in clown because the opposite of that just causes shit to happen, disasters to happen everywhere. So one character could be easy with themselves and one character could not be. Wow. So is that the opposite of what a clown is? Somebody that's not easy yeah. with themselves? I made up a thing a long time ago. A clown is someone with a supple body and a rigid mind. Wow. You have a supple body. You can yeah. do anything. But yeah. your mind is rigid. You're like, I only... Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's supple the opposite body. of a clown? No, that is a that clown. That is a clown. Supple body, rigid, rigid mind. mind. Opposite of a clown would be a flexible mind. I mean, if you think a clown is the character or a clown is the actor, the actor being a clown has to have a flexible mind and a supple body. Yeah. But a clown has a supple body and a rigid mind. The clown's like... This goes here, that goes there, like that. Like, no! This goes here, that, always! You always, know? yeah, yeah, has yeah. To always be that way. Huh. Huh. Because that's what physical comedy is. You keep trying to do impossible things. Mmm. So that's rigid mind. Yeah. Okay. Rigid mind's the guy that runs into the wall, just trips going down the stairs, <laughs> opens the door into his face, and then turns around and like, thinks about it, and then does it again. So it's impossible rigidity. Yeah, and you learn, like, as you construct physical comedy acts, you realize the mind that it takes to make a stupid physical comedy. Like, like just the super simplest thing of like being so overjoyed to see someone that you come to like do that and then you're like, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's okay, I'm, I'm, it's my shoes are flip flops, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom doesn't know, and maybe he gets smart. (laughs) 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. 
that fun. There's fun, a lot of fun in that. Mm. But it teaches you about that mindset because you have to keep tricking yourself. Mm. So the fun is is like making mistakes, being willing to make mistakes, yeah, failure. putting yourself out there to yeah. to try and try and try and try until it's be okay with it, failing. Yeah. Be resilient so you try over and over again. Want to like see my that. weird van? Yeah, we'll, we'll 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 end all of that here. All right. And uh, dang, it's been good. Yeah, man. Let's end it here. Boop. We're gonna go check out his van. Thank you everybody for listening. Please check out the quakecityportal.com for everything mentioned in this episode and other episodes um, on the show notes at thequakecityportal.com. Links to our social media uh, accounts if you want to reach out and say hello or give some support to Dan. Uh, his website will be posted on there as well. And um, as always, thank you for listening. There is so much more to come in the future. See you all down the road.